All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is September 18th, 2023. And my goodness, this is going to be a powerful, powerful video. We're going to show a couple of video clips of recent posts that others have shared um, that some won't like. But once people settle in and realize it, it is so so incredibly exciting. We've been talking about it now for what, three months plus or somewhere in there. We have understood things, brothers and sisters, throughout this ministry for a while now, for a while. We know the time frame of the pre-trib rapture. We know when the mid-trib rapture will happen. We know when the post-trib return of the Lord will happen. We know that there's one more year and when it will happen and what it will mean. We have proven every single one of these things through Scripture. And we can't allow things to get us off track from what we know. It is all from the Word, and I am going to lay it out for you here again tonight. I'm going to show you from Scripture, pre being told to us, mid being told to us, and post being told to us in the times of the year that it takes place. It's in the Scriptures. We've known it. We've absolutely known it. And we're going to cover this today. We're going to go into them, and I'm going to show you. There, there's the obvious places we know that we'll, we'll, we'll touch on, as we generally do when we talk on these things. But I'm going to lay it out, and I'm going to show you some incredible shares that were done. One from our brother Chris in the forum, and another one from our brother Al, another Al. And anybody who's interested and wants to join us in the forum, it's free. It'll take a few seconds to sign up. Just go to ministryrevealed.com, click the description box, go to forum, sign up for free. We've got close to 1,200 people around the world in there. Come and join us. Sharing, Bible, prayers, news, events, all sorts of things in there. So they had shared, um, Chris had shared something from a, 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 um, a, a special, a certain Sabbath and what they read from the Sabbath. And I thought, oh my goodness. This is over the top where they where they share this from, uh, uh, where they read from in Scripture when the Jews read from it at this certain time of year. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you want to talk about perfect. And why? Why? What made it perfect for us? Well, you're going to see what makes it perfect is something that we have here in, in the revelation of the end of days. That's called the chapters to years. When you see where this is in chapters to years. You're going to say, oh, my goodness, it's perfect. Well, <clears throat> then what happened, our brother Al had shared on a couple of things, and he shared a piece of scripture that's read at the time of the Feast of Trumpets. And <laughs> when you see when it's read at the Feast of Trumpets and where this piece is in scripture, you're going to say, oh, my goodness, this is impossible. But. Not only that, on day two of the day and hour, no one knows, they read another one. And the one that they read from that one is just as fitting as the first. Well, then it turns out there's another place that they read from only on that day two. And that one is from another place, but not in the chapters to years. But in a piece of scripture, we have been revealing here for about three years that tells us the exact time of the great multitude rapture. Just as I'm going to lay out for you throughout the one piece of scripture that actually tells us when it, when it all is. So I, as Al had shared that one in this one chapter to your connection, I noticed that the second day of it was the next one. And <laughs> what's awesome, and then I realized there was the one in this other place that showed the mid-trib rapture. And what's fantastic about this is we've done a video not too long ago. Uh, where is it? The day, but of that day and hour. And I did a short video, one of the shorts that just recently came out, that we can know the day and hour. Well, we've shown here that the Lord is coming for the mid-trib rapture after six years of seals, and he's coming at the time of the Feast of Trumpets. That's not when the rapture happens, though. And then 
He's here during the portion of trumpets, the last year of seals and a portion of trumpets. And then he's cut off and he returns again at the end of the 13th year at the Feast of Trumpets. And then he's gone, right? Or then he's dealing with the things of the world. And then it's all over after that final year at the Feast of Trumpets. And then there's the shofar on the 10th day to announce the Jubilee. And then what? Then it's the Feast of Tabernacles when it's all over. And it's the final wedding of Judah of Matthew chapter 25. These are unbelievable things that we've been able to, to show and to prove from Scripture. And it turns out the Jews are reading from these things that we have revealed in Scripture for the past several years. They are reading them on the day of these events. Well, as I continue to look, I thought, well, I wonder if there's one connected to the pre-trib somewhere. So I went and read to the one that I know is revealed from Scripture is absolutely going to be at pre-trib on the true date. And guess what? Oh, wouldn't you know it? Of course, there's somebody talked about in there in a book from Scripture that is directly related 100% to the Gentile bride of Christ. I'm telling you guys, we have understood. We know it. We know it. It's always been, what year is it going to happen in? That's really been the mystery. And, and as the years have progressed and we've been trying to discern and figure out what this year is that it's going to begin in, well, this year, well, several years, but this year also in particular has been incredibly powerful in the revelations of these, of these minute details that have brought so much incredible clarity. We have video after video breaking these things down from the 50 days and all of the events that take place in it to when the seven, uh, uh, this first seven years of seals and then the seven years of trumpets begin. We've shown why Luke's discourse says this, why Mark says this, why Matthew says that. We know that they start at the white and then the others start at the red. I mean, we've broken all these things down. Well, today I'm going to show to you. I'm going to lay it out that we know the day of the pre, the mid, and the post. Now, day and hour, you know, like within a couple of days. The only thing with the first one, with the pre-trib, is, you know, what is the true time of that feast? Well, we'll know next year. There's only really two options, but really it's the second one because when the 50 days are over, as you guys know, it has to line up to the Feast of Trumpets. That, that's why these videos are so incredible. That's why this is such a powerful video. The, the level of detail from what? From first beginning to understand who the Gospels are speaking to. So for anybody that's new to the ministry, this is where you want to come. I put some new thumbnails on the four intro videos. Come to the Revealed End Time Study Note series and watch the first four videos. Or you can go to ministryrevealed.com, go to the intro page and watch the first four videos. And then as you start to grasp it, then you can continue into the deeper parts. You're going to see who the Gospels are speaking to and all of these differences that people thought were contradictions in Scripture are actually prophetic revelation for the end of days. We have revealed dozens of them, and they all tell us the same story. It, is, it has boggled people's mind for centuries, and I believe it's because it simply wasn't yet the time to be revealed. But we've been blessed with it for the past six years. What happens when you understand who the Gospels are speaking to? And you can understand the timing of Luke's discourse, Mark's discourse, Matthew's discourse. You realize that the truth of the end of days is 14 years. There's a 14 years and a portion called above that Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He has given us a prophetic picture. Like I talk about in these shorts a lot. He gives us a prophetic picture of the end of days revealing that in a period of 14 days and a little bit of a portion of above, which we revealed is 50 days, pre, mid, and post are all 
true. Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Because what? The first will be last and the last will be first. How did this uh, get all missed? Well, you're going to come to understand when you get to the fourth video in this, the first ones are only like 20 to 30 minutes each, the first three. The first one kind of gives you a little layout of what the next two are going to talk about. And then the next two, so the second and the third, are about 30 minutes each. And then the fourth one is like two hours and 45 minutes called It's All Because of Matthew. And that is, that's essentially the entire story. It's all because of Matthew is the reason why we never understood who Mark and who Luke were speaking to in the Synoptic Gospels, because all of our lives we've been taught from Matthew. So that gave us a foundational view through Matthew, a lens through the, through the Jewish perspective of their portion of time, that when we looked at everything else that was prophetic in prophecy, we associated it simply to one seven-year period, and people twisted everything up. This is the revelation that opens it all up, brings clarity, and we have done it with over 500 videos from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, revealing the entirety of it. And this today is going to absolutely show you when pre, mid, and post will take place. When are the comings of the Lord? How does, he, how does it all play out? It is given to us in Scripture in numerous places. All right? So that's what we're going to get into today. For anybody who hasn't seen this video, this is a video right here, a powerful conversation from poisoning to book burning. Uh, what else does it say? To book burning to understanding. So this is me having a, a Zoom chat with our buddy Steve in Uganda who has the ministry out there that we support. And man, it, uh, there's only a thousand views. Like, what the heck? I'm telling you guys, you need to watch it. It's incredible to hear what they go through over there. It's incredible to hear the persecution. He was poisoned. Uh, a few years back before we met him, his, his whole house was chloroformed. And his whole family was knocked unconscious in their house as the robbers came in and stole everything. And then recently, the events that took place as he was bringing Bibles that we help him support to bring Bibles to all these communities that he teaches before he gives and to get our books, the Ministry Revealed book, printed to give to the people after he helps teach them and give them understanding with the team that he has there. It's incredible. The pastors caused people that were receiving these books and beginning to receive the understanding of the revelation to prepare them for the time of the end after they had received salvation and had their Bibles already. They were taking the books and over a thousand of the first books that were printed, he found walking through villages, they were thrown in trash cans. They were being burned. They were thrown in ditches. They were in puddles. And these pastors... There was a group of pastors that all spoke against him and his team for these teachings until they fasted and prayed. And they and I'm not going to go into all of it, but they fasted and prayed for two or three days because individually some of these pastors were calling. So they fasted and prayed and they said, Lord, please lead us. If, if you want us to continue with these teachings, with this revelation from this book, with the scriptures of salvation, and combining them together to prepare the people, he says, please help us to know. Please let us know. Please let us understand that we should be doing this. And they get a phone call from the 30 pastors, 30 of the pastors that had come against them the following day. Like, I don't know if it was within hours or a day, got in touch with them and requested that they all come out and teach them. They would set up all of the tents for all the people to come and they would apologize to all of their people and tell them to listen to what these guys are sharing. Mind blowing. That's just a little piece. So there's almost an hour conversation. If you haven't, man, listen to it. It is so worth it. It is so powerful. And then if you felt, if you feel led, feel free to share, feel free to, to um, pray, of course, always. And if you're feeling led, to support the ministry, which you can do in the comment, uh, in the description box under the videos at uh, either PayPal or our GoFundMe page. It's, it's so incredible. 
And so let me show you this. You see, we support them. We support them regularly, th continuously throughout the month. And this is our brother, Steve. And there was a whole load of Bibles that came in. These are um, study Bibles that came in so that he can go and teach these pastors that are just newly learning. And they can have study notes and they can take notes and they can start doing proper teachings. And this is cases that through the support of the ministry here, he was able to go pick up. <laughs> he wasn't able to ride the motorcycle, though, he said. <laughs> he had to get a friend to come and do it because he couldn't balance it. <laughs> thought that was funny. So that's what's going on over there. And uh, I, I'm so grateful. I'm honored to be a part of it with each and every one of you. And uh, that him and his team are just such a dedicated, committed group of brothers and sisters spreading the word and preparing the people. Um, it's beautiful. So with that, let's get going. Now, as I was telling you guys, you know, we're going to see what the pre, mid and post are that scriptures tell us. But we're also going to see something else. We're going to see details of something we have shown in Scripture over the years that I had never caught before when I show you where pre, mid, and post are all laid out. Many of you have seen where the pre, mid, and post all are. But I think a reminder is necessary because I think a lot of people are maybe feeling a little bit down and out. Some people are thinking maybe there's still a month to go. It should have been tr Feast of Trumpets. It's not Feast of Trumpets, guys. I promise you with all of my heart, Scripture has shared with us that the pre-trib Bride of Christ is not at the Feast of Trumpets, and it has nothing to do with the fall feasts. Isn't it funny? Everybody says, or I shouldn't say everybody. Most people say, oh, all the spring feasts were fulfilled. Right From Passover to Pentecost, everything's been fulfilled. We don't have to look at those anymore. Says who? Says who? You know, I was just talking to my wife about that the other day. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? I think what happened, and I'm just speculating, but I believe it's probably somebody years and years and years ago that made this comment that because these were fulfilled, then there's only the fall feast left. So everything's going to happen at the fall feasts. And then everybody hears that and they just start running with it, running with it, running with it, running with it. And then the other portion says, nobody knows the day or hour and think it means nothing can be understood. Not the day, not, uh, not the day and hour, but especially not even the month or the year. I got a short that just came out on that or that's coming out on that if it hasn't. Of course, you can know what the day and hour means. It's the Feast of Trumpets. Revelation 16 uh, no, Revelation 9, verse 15 proves it to us when it tells us the, the angels that were prepared for a day and an hour and a month and a year such as this. You see, because we have that in Scripture, we can point to Mark and Matthew's discourses of the day and hour no one knows and know that it means uh, uh, that it doesn't mean a month or a year. Because if it was also meant to be a month and a year that wasn't to be understood, it could have written it as it did in Revelation 9.15. Hello. You see? So we can understand these things. The scripture that talks about this detail that I'm going to get into as we go throughout all of this is, is so incredible when it caught my attention. Because like I said, I know people are, are disappointed at this point. But don't worry. Don't worry. We have less than a year to go. We know the pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ, the pre-trib like a rapture, is at the Feast of Weeks. It is at the true Feast of Weeks. Whatever that true Feast of Weeks day is next year, I believe with all of the revelation and what we've recently learned in these past several months, with Jeremiah 25, what we have learned from when Jesus said in Luke 4, the Jubilee, when he, he said the acceptable day of the Lord or the acceptable year of the Lord, he was proclaiming the Jubilee. And when we followed that Jubilee count, it equaled the Jubilee of the 15th year or in the big picture, 22nd year after the seven easy, and then seven of seals and seven of trumpets came to an end. Do you understand that when people tell you, oh, the Jubilee was last year, 
or the Jubilee was in 2017 or so on and so forth. If you believe that, do you know what it means? Then you can't believe that the pre-trib or the rapture is anytime close. You would have to believe it's another 30 something years away. Because the Jubilee isn't until the final seven of the seven Shemitah years of Sabbaths are over. Hello. <laughs> it's so awesome. So when we went into this, when we've broken these things down, let me show you. Uh, which one is it? Where is it? Where is it? This one here. And we've gone into these things. You see? 2037 to 2038 is that final 14th year of tribulation or the seventh year of trumpets. We know what happens and then there's your jubilee. We've counted this jubilee all the way back from the year that the time frame of when Christ proclaimed it and it equaled right here. Well, what, what, what does this year equal? Well, it's the year after the 70th year from when they came and had Jerusalem in full. That's 70 years. Jeremiah 25 said after 70 years, then he would bring destruction as the treading of the grapes. Like, like, uh, like Revelation 19. It's, it's because this is the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. And when it's all done, what is it? It's the final Jubilee. So am I excited for next year? <laughs> Heck yes. It, it's, it's almost too hard to believe, to imagine. You know, we talk about it all the time. We share that this is really it. We are the final generation. They are back in the land. We've been able to show all of these connections for six years by the leading of the Holy Ghost with purpose, with, with truth in the revelation because we've been able to do it hundreds of times, proving out the same thing. And I'm going to even add to that tonight a lot. And what does it all point to? It all points to 2024 at the true feast of weeks. It's absolutely incredible. So now let me share you this a few minutes of a couple of videos. Have a listen to this. Now, do I usually pay too much attention to this? No, but our brother, Uncle Jimmy, who takes care of our YouTube and he's doing some video stuff and working on some incredible, <laughs> he's, he's working hard behind the scenes on an incredible video compilation of Ministry Revealed I don't know. He doesn't know either how long it's going to take, but it's going to be awesome. Well, he posted this in uh, in uh, on our Facebook for Ministry Revealed, and I had to listen to it. I want you to listen to it for a few minutes here. If you're listening to my video now on fast speed, I've got this on 1.75. So it's going to be very fast uh, for you. So you might want to slow down your video uh, until you listen to this. Okay. Generally, I don't, I don't listen to too many of these. But when Uncle Jimmy posted it, I thought, all right, let me check it out. We'll have a listen. And this is only one. Everything escalated the very day I was rushed to the hospital when my time was due. I knew very well I was not going to come back. I couldn't keep the pains and suffering anymore. The medical team worked relentlessly to secure my And so what happened, it's, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> this woman was pregnant and she was having, she had a very difficult uh, pregnancy and she knew that she was going to die while she was in the hospital. And uh, she has this dying experience. And listen to what is said. My survival and the safe birth of my baby. As my situation deteriorated, the doctors and nurses went above and beyond to provide their best care as possible. They kept a tight eye on my vital signs and administered drugs and therapies to help stabilize my condition. Their communication was quick and efficient as they worked together to resolve whatever issues that arose. At that moment, an overwhelming mix of agony and regret grabbed me as the labor pains increased and difficulties mounted. The physical pain alone seemed to fuse with the emotional distress, creating a tumultuous storm within me. In those moments, I couldn't help but think back on my journey, the hopes and the goals I had for myself and my unborn kid. Deep regret gnawed in my heart as I wished I had more time to plan, make memories, and be the mother I hoped to be. The doctors did their best, but I was unable to make it as I felt my life, living my body on the hospital bed. As I breathed my final breaths, the anguish and remorse began to diminish, to be replaced by a quiet acceptance. A sense of weightlessness overtook me as my breaths became shallower and the world around me disappeared. Suddenly, I saw myself being gently lifted from the constraints of my body, and I noticed I had gone beyond the realm of the living. The agony that had overwhelmed me began to fade, and was replaced by a calmness. I found myself in an unknown place, filled with brightness and ethereal beauty throughout the transition, 
I saw beautiful and new colors I had never seen in real life before encircled me, producing a warm and soothing glow. But I realized I wasn't alone when I looked around. I saw figures with radiant wings that arose as a presence of pure light and love that surrounded me. I saw angels of the heavenly beauty. They stood in front of me. Their presence provided a sense of calmness and peace that I can't ever explain. These celestial beings radiated warmth and understanding, their gentle smiles conveying a sense of reassurance. It was as if they knew my pain, my regrets, and my hopes. They embraced me with an acceptance that felt like a long-awaited embrace. I felt a profound connection to these angels, as if they were guiding me through this transition to a place of profound peace. Their presence was a balm to my weary soul, and in their company, I began to release the burdens of regret that had weighed me down. My pains and discomfort were... You know his name. Oh, well. <laughs> We'll have to let it go. He's a pioneer in the fashion industry. Creator of a six- Were replaced by a profound sense of freedom, and the regrets were transformed into lessons learned. Then, I heard a voice that resonated like a harmonious melody. Then I saw one of the angels move closer, and began to speak to me. He revealed glimpses of what lay ahead, a series of events that would unfold in the world I had left behind by the year 2024. Each revelation was accompanied by a deep sense of clarity, and a feeling of being connected to a greater cosmic narrative. It seemed as if I was being gently guided to understand that life, despite in its warts and uncertainties, was a journey worth enjoying. The future they presented was a reminder that, while our time in the physical world is short, the influence of our love and actions can resound through eternity. As I stood in the presence of the angel, with a voice that seemed to reverberate from a distant dimension, the angel began to offer a vision of a future marked by civil war and conflict. I watched events spread before me, like shards of a faraway world. A nation in Europe will rise against another nation again. Most African leaders will be chased and persecuted by the military. This will bring war and destruction to many countries. The streets that were once filled with laughter and life were now darkened by the shadows of discord. People who had once stood side by side were now arrayed against each other, motivated by divisions that seemed insurmountable. The angel's voice was filled with grief as he narrated the upheaval that had overtaken the earth. He spoke of political instability, ideological divides, and the struggle for control that had erupted into a full-blown civil war. I saw families were torn apart, communities were broken, and the fabric of society strained to its limits. As I watched these scenes unfold, a weight settled within me. I felt the grief and anguish of people caught in the thick of the fight, the lives disturbed, and the dreams crushed. It was as if the angel's vision transported me to a future that was both frightening and hauntingly real. One of the angels stepped forward again and began to show me a future that will shock the world itself. I saw an unfathomable earthquake. I saw landscapes that were familiar yet altered. Cities teeming with vitality were suddenly overtaken by pandemonium. Buildings that previously stood tall and proud were reduced to rubble, and streets that once thrived were now cluttered with ashes. The angel's descriptions were vivid, and I could practically feel the tremors that raced through the ground. The magnitude of the earthquake they reported was startling. It felt as if the very foundations of the planet were being rocked. I saw people scurrying for safety, their faces etched with terror and amazement as the ground shook beneath them. The angel's voice held a wave of melancholy as they spoke of the lives that will be lost in the wake of this calamity. The saddest part was families being torn apart and communities destroyed, and a sense of collective anguish that transcended borders. This was really heartbreaking and revealing. With a voice that appeared to carry the weight of the planet, the angel began to give another set of vision of a future with an unprecedented and horrific famine. I watched places that were once lush and lively, converted into bleak wastelands. Fields that formerly supplied copious harvests sat barren and cracked, unable to produce enough to sustain the communities that relied on them. The things I saw was frightening. It showed how resources will become scars in the coming year. The famine the angel portrayed was not isolated to a single region. It was a global calamity that afflicted nations far and wide. Families that once had enough to eat now battled to obtain what to survive on, their faces marked with tiredness and sorrow. Communities that had thrived were suddenly coping with poverty and sorrow on an unthinkable scale. As the angel conveyed this vision, they warned of the lives that would be appended of children going hungry, and of the ripple effects that would resonate through society. It was a heart-wrenching picture of the fragility of human existence and the vulnerability of our interdependent environment. While in the presence of the angels, their looks contained both understanding and intensity, as if they were conveying a mission of tremendous significance. With a voice that resonated with knowledge, the angel said words that appeared to reverberate deep within my spirit. He said, go back. His voice was carrying a feeling of heaviness. He continued, Say to the world what you have seen and witnessed here. You have been given a peek into the future. What is to come in the year 2024? And with that understanding comes a responsibility to bring consciousness to the world. You have seen the fate that lies ahead. With a sense of resolution, I nodded in agreement. And I asked, how can the world prevent all these from happening? He answered back by saying, the world must repent and turn back to God. It was evident that my trip was not over. That I had... 2024, the word from the angel when all of this begins. That was interesting, wasn't it? Now... It's one of those near-death experiences or death experiences. Again, do we do we base our entire understanding on things like this? No, we never have. However, this is an interesting one. And it was posted a little, little over two weeks ago, which means it happened a short time before that. Well, check this one out. Many of you guys know this pastor. Marcus Rogers, he's got probably one of the biggest uh, Christian ministries out there uh, for YouTube subscribers anyways. Well, this was posted in the forum the other day and people, well, I was excited about it. 
and <laughs> it didn't get many likes or thumbs up or hearts in the forum because I know many people were looking at these fall feasts and some of them still are looking at the fall feast and now thinking one month off and maybe they'll go two days off and then they'll go two weeks off and then one month off, maybe possibly then going to Hanukkah and then trying to say tabernacles and then Hanukkah. I mean, guys, we have understood. That's what I'm trying to get across. So now listen to this. Marcus is generally an excitable, very excited guy, loves the Lord. But this one, he was so excited. And what he doesn't understand is what the Lord was actually telling him was coming at this time that he tells him. He thinks it's, you know, a renewal in your church, a renewal in your marriage, you know, blessings and so forth, that, that the good is going to be victorious. He wasn't fully understanding the, the, the depth of what was being said. But at the same point, he's ready. They're understanding. You know, it's okay. Have a listen to this. I hate to say it this way because it's going to make religious people mad. I'm so high in the spirit right now. You know, I got so much joy and so much peace about what God is doing. I mean, I was happy waking up at five o'clock this morning and rolling the garbage cans down. And I hate doing that. But I, I, I was I felt good. I said, man, it, it feels good to get the garbage out of the house. It feels good to roll the garbage down to the corner because it's something about when you when you're under the influence. All right. Not of your feelings, your emotions of what's going on in the world. But when you're under the influence of, of God, let this mind be in you. When you spend so much time in the presence, I was talking to them yesterday to get drunk. Right. You, 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 you can't just take a little sip. You can't take a little gulp. You got to you gotta indulge that thing. And the more that you drink, right, it goes through your blood. It gets in your blood, right? And the more that you drink, the longer it takes to get out your system. The more you spend time in the presence of God, right, in prayer and reading your word, it gets in your system. David says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so it's like, it's just bubbling up. And I'm just like super, I came home just, just glowing. You know, I'm like, like baby, man, church was awesome. You know, she just had the baby, so she's resting. And I'm just feeling so good in my spirit. And I'm just worshiping, I'm worshiping, I'm worshiping. I'm so excited. I'm so in love with Jesus. Like, I feel renewed. I feel restored. I feel like the best is yet to come. And so I drop my kids off at school. And, and, and I'm riding back and I feel the presence of God with me just like I did the other day. And the Lord says in one year, clear as day, he says in one year, I'm about to change everything dramatically. In Bam. one year, people are about to be vindicated. In one year, some of you are going to go from the bottom to being on the top, being who God has called you to be. Some of you have been wondering, you've been looking and saying, God, why do these people get to represent the kingdom? Why do the wicked get to prosper? Why am I going through this? Why is my marriage going through this? When is my business going to take off? When am I going to see the promises of God in my life? And God says, look, in one year. The word he gave me, one year, dramatic change. And I wrote it on Facebook. I typed it. I said, guys, in one year, God just told me there's going to be dramatic change. And I said, like this. There you go. One year, dramatic change. Not, not in your business, not in your marriage. No, 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 no. Dramatic change is coming to the entire world next year. In one year comment comment on it so we can come back in one year and test and see if it was true like dramatic change there's going to be dramatic change in the politics there's going to be dramatic change in the churches that have been faithful that have been consistent that are not about the money that are not about the fame but they just want to see jesus glorified there's going to be dramatic change on just the landscape of what is religion and tradition we're going to start moving into truth there's going to be a dramatic change of the guard the first shall be last and the last shall be first i feel this thing so strong in my spirit guys mark my words in one year your whole life is going to change and let me tell you something in one year in one year, dramatic change. He took that to mean other things that life is going to carry on, but it's going to get better for people. For some, yes, it'll be the better that it could ever be because we'll be in the presence of the Lord. But check this out. It was also posted about two weeks ago. So it happened just a little shortly before that. Interesting, isn't it? Two of them, about two to three weeks ago, being posted about 2024 in one year. Does that, does, and, and he heard the voice of God clearly tell him he had gone out into the wilderness to this place where he had first met the Lord and, and, and prayed and was, it was, you know, meditating on the Lord and so forth. And it started to happen. And then after with his kids and so forth, he heard the Lord clear as day say in one year dramatic change is coming brothers and sisters i'm telling you it's one year it's next year and it will begin at the true feast of weeks of 2024 because of those videos no no it has nothing to do with those videos as you know it's all about the revelation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in his word. It's the digging into his word and the blessings we've received to be able to open up his revelation.
to open the books. It, it, we know this one, right? How many times have I been sharing on this one lately uh, and, and, and referring back to it in the shorts that I've been posting? Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, clearly, unequivocally, no exceptions, tells us that there's a period of 14 years and a piece called above, which we have revealed for a few, for like five plus years now, is a period of 50 days. And he says, one is like a rapture. That's the pre-trip to the third heaven. The other one is the rapture. They're going to paradise. And the third time is when he's coming to them and he's not bringing them any more burdens. A taking, a taking, and a return. And it'll all begin in a period called above. When does that above begin? Who's it for? It's for those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, like Romans tells us. So th this is one. This is one. It's, it, this one's not a mystery for us. We've understood that one now for a long time. I have another shorts video coming out sometime this week uh, that's already scheduled in. How about looking at um, the book of Revelation? Do you know the book of Revelation shows us pre, mid, and post? Did you know that? Look what happens here. Look at uh, Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, which means pre-trib, even before the first seal. For thou was slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Hello. A group of people standing before the Lord who were redeemed and they're there before the seals are open. Where, where, where's the mid-trip? That's the easiest one of them all. Revelation chapter 7, between the sixth and the seventh seal, we see the great multitude, which now no man can number, that stood before the throne. Who is this group? That's the great multitude rapture that happens at what we call mid-trip in the midst of the seventh year of seals. Remember, the Lord is coming at the Feast of Trumpets, right? Right at that time of the Feast of Trumpets, after six years of tribulation that will go from trumpets to trumpets, and it will leave one year of the seventh seal. What happens during that one year of the seventh seal? There's no wars. You remember that? You know there's no wars, right? The Ezekiel 39 war, remember this? The Ezekiel 39 war right here, which is connected to the sixth seal, which is the time of the end of the sixth seal time frame. This is when he comes and the whole world sees him at the end of the sixth seal and they're freaking out. Rocks and, uh, rocks and mountains fall on us. And this is that battle of his first of his two swords. It's the Ezekiel 39 war. It's the, it's the Revelation 17 when he destroys the, the, with the battle with the beast and the 10 kings. This is it. it. It happens at the end of the sixth seal. It's the Ezekiel 39 war. What happens in the seventh year of seals? There's no war. It's a time of rest. I don't know if you guys realize that. The, the seven years of seals is six years of seals of which the first year will begin at the Feast of Trumpets and it will be the red horse rider. The white horse rider, son of man, is part of the 50 days. The red horse rider, like Mark and Matthew's discourses, begin with nation against nation. A great sword being given, peace removed from the earth, which happens at the 50th day. And then what? Feast of Trumpets, Red Horse Rider, and six years. And then the Lord seen, com seen coming. They all gather to battle against him. It's the Ezekiel 39 war. He destroys the enemies. Antichrist is killed. We know he's brought back when the pit is open. But he's killed. So what's happening during the seventh year? A time of rest. 
we saw in Revelation 7 that the 144,000, where is it? That the 144,000 are sealed first, and then it's the great multitude rapture. We've shown from Mark's discourse, because Luke equals pre, Mark equals the time of seals and mid, Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets and post. And a lot of people might say, well, what happens to Matthew or Judah during the time of the seven years of seals? Well, that first attack with the red horse rider, when nation against nation begins, it starts at Jerusalem. They're scattered and they're removed in captivity and, and death and everything. They're, they're fleeing to the mountains like, Mark's, uh, like Luke's discourse says. And they're fleeing. And they're scattered for the next seven years except for a small group that will be brought back because they believe they're going to be able to start rebuilding the temple, but only the foundation will get laid during seals, as we've taught. So they're scattered, and then, bang, nation against nation, World War III breaks out, but it begins at Jerusalem. So you got six years of those seals, one, uh, of seals two through six. Then, in the midst, around the middle time frame, of the seventh year of seals is the great multitude rapture, which would be in the midst right here of the seventh year, which means six years of seals from red horse to the end, from the second seal to the end of the sixth seal. And then you've got one year of rest. And what do we even see? So we see the 144,000 sealed. We see the great multitude rapture. And then you see silence in heaven for the seventh seal which says for about half an hour, which I believe translates into a picture prophetically of about six months. This, this is a quiet time. There's no war. There's not all this devastation and everything else happening. That happened during the six years, not in the seven. But what do you know takes place during the seven years of trumpets? During the seven years of trumpets, we know during the first about three and a half years, the city and the streets and the temple are getting rebuilt. We know that there's, of course, the first four trumpets that are falling and destroying other parts of the earth as well, or that are being blown and destroying different parts of the earth as well, while Jerusalem is protected and surrounded. Again, it's not every part of the earth affected because the 144,000 are going out during trumpets while this is taking place over the first three and a half years. Then the pit is open. Satan has two and a half years of these six years of trumpets. And at the end of that sixth year, then the Lord who was cut off when the pit was open, then will return feet down on the Mount of Olives at the beginning of the seventh year of trumpets. This is the Matthew one, when he'll be seen from one end of the earth as lightning to the other. But... Is this seventh year a year of, uh, of, of uh, peace or a year of, um, uh, of rest? No. No. This seventh year is not a year of rest. This seventh year of trumpets is the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. It doesn't play out like seals. It's six years, and then it's the seventh one is a rest. In trumpets, it's six years, and then the seventh year is when he brings the destruction against Satan, Antichrist. Uh, Satan gets bound. Uh, Antichrist and, and the false prophet are destroyed. The enemies that gathered are destroyed, and it plays out over a year. In the seventh year. And then the rest begins because it is the final jubilee year. The Jubilee in the big picture, and for those that are new, you see it's like seven, 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 seven. Why do we have a, a big picture of 21 to 22 years? Well, the Hebrew alphabet is 22 letters. Book of, of Revelation is 22 chapters. We go to the story of, uh, and this is where it really came from. You go to the story of, uh, of Jacob with Leah and Rachel. He worked seven years and then got Leah. Then, even though he was expecting Rachel, then after the wedding, 
of Leah, he got Rachel, but he still had to serve seven more years. After he served those seven years, he stayed for six more years for a total of 20 years. <clears throat> and at the end of those 20 years, he made a covenant with his father-in-law. What do we know happens after the Fort, uh, uh, after the 13th year of tribulation, the Lord's going to return and renew the covenant that he made at the end of seals that he had to break when the pit was open and he was cut off, that he will renew at the start of the 14th year and when it's the year of the Lord's vengeance. So you've got six and one, then you've got seven and the eighth, which is the final jubilee. The beginning of the millennial reign. All of this is in order. This is something we have taught on now for years. But I'm going to show it to you. <clears throat> revealed to us in scripture as we keep going. So I showed you the mid-trib in chapter 5 of Revelation. I'm uh, sorry, the pre-trib. That's the Luke group. This is your mid-trib between the 6th and the 7th. You see, because uh, uh, when, when is the mid-trib rapture then? Is it the day and hour no one knows? No. This is why people get so confused. The day and hour that no one knows that we read about in Mark's discourse and Matthew's for that matter. But in Mark's discourse, the day and hour that no one knows has nothing to do with the rapture. The, the mid-trib rapture. It's about the coming of the Son of Man. After that tribulation, the tribulation of seals. When he's seen coming in the clouds, plural, when is this time? When is this time? It tells us the day and hour no one knows. Is it the rapture? No. It's not the rapture. It's his coming seen at the end of the sixth year of seals. It's not the rapture. It's not the mid-trib rapture. This is why, as many of you know, in Mark chapter 9, when you read the, the, the ones of the transfiguration of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, and we know how they all read differently the days as pictures of years, it says, um, and some which will not taste of death till they have seen, past tense, have seen the kingdom of God come with power. This is all past tense. Because they will have seen him coming at the, after the sixth year of seals. And at the time of the Feast of Trumpets of that year, which will be 2030. And when they see him, they're probably all going to be thinking, the rapture's coming, the, the rapture, oh, finally, Lord. <clears throat> but it's not coming yet. It's not coming yet. They're going to be protected. They're going to be set aside. Things are going to happen. But it's going to take about six months. This is the only one that has the past tense, will have seen. It's awesome. Okay? And so where, of course, is the post-trib? Well, the post-trib, we all know it here as well. It's in two places in Revelation uh, that... It's even more, but we can tell, we know where to simply show up by showing the Feast of Trumpets. Because that, that battle that we were talking about, that Ezekiel 39, when he comes at the end of the sixth seal, before that seventh year is the year of rest, that's the Revelation 17 battle. That's his first sword of the two that he talks about, I think, in Luke 22. The, the second battle at the, at, the, at the year of the Lord is the one in Revelation 19 which is the winepress of the wrath of God. Hence, why the wrath of the grapes or the grapes of wrath or the treading of the grapes in Jeremiah 25 told us it would come after 70 years was complete. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so awesome. Okay. So where's this? Well, listen to what it says. This is in Revelation 10. But in those days... uh. Sorry, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared it to his servants, the prophets. 
it's over. What what is this period that is now over? It's what we read in Daniel chapter 12. When Daniel and, and the angel that's there and he's saying, oh, how long is it going to be, right? He's like, you, you've shown me this incredible catastrophe that's coming. He's talking about mid-trumpets when Messiah is cut off after the temple was rebuilt. How long is this going to last? And he says it shall be for a time, times, and a half. There's no and here, so there's no addition. It means one, two, and a half. This is two and a half years of the final three and a half years of trumpets that Revelation 12, 14 talks about. And listen to what it says. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Why? Why does it sound... Why does it have the same wording as Revelation 10 at the seventh trumpet? Well, if we go to Revelation 11, let's read what the seventh trumpet says. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were there was and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world and the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever. The kingdoms of this world, sorry, are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. Do you know when the Lord reigns forever? The only place you read about it is at the end of Matthew's gospel. This was a picture of the end of days, which is why Luke, Mark, and Matthew, at the end of each of their books in their commission, is completely different from each other. And it's only Matthew's that says, teaching them to observe all, all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. When? When he comes at the 14th year. He's with them until the end of the world. Revelation has just shown you pre, mid, and post. We saw the first one was was in the throne room, was was in the third heaven. We see the second one, they're with the Lord. And when you understand, when the Lord is seen coming at the end of the sixth seal and all these armies gather around against them, look at this. We, we've shown it in the Apocrypha many times in second Esdras. Okay, they war against each other. Then my son will be revealed. And an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together as you saw, desiring to come to conquer him but he shall stand on the top of Mount Zion. Mount Zion. That's why in Revelation 14, the lamb is on Mount Zion with the 144,000 and you get all sorts of crazy ideas of what it means and they think that they must be in up in the third heaven or something. No, it's the Lord that has come at the end of the sixth seal on heavenly Mount Zion, the mountain carved without hand. He's come down with paradise, the place he had prepared for them. He is now going to receive them unto himself, which is the mid-trib rapture group. And Zion will come to be made manifest to all people prepared and built, as you saw a mountain carved without hands. So awesome. So, so, so awesome. So you saw a pre in the third heaven. We see the mid-trib and their part of, of paradise. And in the third one, we see him coming down to them because now he's with them until the end of the world. So we've got pre, mid, and post revealed to us over a period of 14 and above from Paul. We've got Revelation 5, 7, 10, and 11 showing us pre, mid, and post. <laughs> you see how awesome? It's everywhere. All right. Here's the one in, in Matthew 24, and people say, um, and, and they try to connect this to pre. But it even says immediately after the tribulation of those days. What did Mark say? After that tribulation. This is immediately after the tribulation of those days. What happens after the tribulation of those days? This is when he's seen coming, even though the word says in, you go to the definition, it means on the clouds. We've talked many times of this over the years. And then what happens? It's the day and hour no one knows. And it's the, it's the year of the Lord, the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. And that's the year of Noah. 
which is a year and 10 days long. We know it with absolute unequivocal certainty that pre, mid, and post are all true in a period called 14 years and above. And we've revealed it all the way back to the great picture from the beginning of creation. It's always been what year? And and when when are these things actually going to happen? So if, if we're finally in the year in 2024, when are these things going to happen? Right? And, and what about the following years? When, when, when is the great multitude rapture? When does the Lord return feet down on the Mount of Olives? Of which both mid and post relate to him coming at the day and hour no one knows, which is either, I want you to remember this, which is either going to be at the mid-trib rapture, the first day of the Feast of Trumpets, or the second day of the Feast of Trumpets. When he comes at the end of the 13th year or, or returns feet down at the start of the 14th year, at the seventh year of trumpets, 14th year of tribulation, it will be on the first or the second day of trumpets. When it's over, it will be the first or the second day of trumpets. The And, and some will say, well, it's not really trumpets because it's the declaration of the Jubilee. So it'll be 10 more days. Then they sound the Jubilee on atonement at the end of that 14th year plus 10 days trumpet of atonement only in that 49th year and then what happens then they're gathered for the wedding they're gathered for the matthew 25 jewish wedding the pre-trib the pre gentile bride wedding was way back at the beginning of the 50 days at the pre-trib escape that's why Luke has a wedding story and Matthew has a wedding story and Mark has not. So incredible. Now, I wanted to remind you guys of this. There's the principle, okay? The day-year principle or year-for-a-day principle is a method of interpretation of Bible prophecy which a word uh, uh, in which the word day in prophecy can be considered a symbolic year of actual time and vice versa, all right? So this is something we've shared many, many times. We, we've shown it from the transfiguration stories. We've showed it from the original 14thers, and, and lo and behold, we were called 14ers. Theirs was 14 days. We're talking about the revelation of 14 years. Uh, we, we've shown it from the story of the ark with the seven days and the seven days. It's we, We've shown it with another familiar one, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, which is also Enoch. Years as days in Enoch's case. It happens and we have shown it many, 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 many times. So now let's get into this and let me show you these incredible, incredible details. I hope you're ready. Because as much as some people don't want to accept it yet, <clears throat> that's okay. That's okay. But we're, we're still here. We're not going anywhere, like I said before. Okay? We're here, and as long as we're here, we've got to keep digging, right? Of course, I would have hoped I was wrong and that it was going to be at trumpets or tabernacles or whatever. But it 100% won't be pre-trip. Not in. I'm not saying that in arrogance or anything like that. For me to accept any other time of year, for me personally, would be to deny the revelation that I've been given to understand. And I just can't do it. Look at how clearly we've been able to show the connection to trumpets. And yet we know there's 50 days before. Hello. Watch this. Remember this? We've gone through it three times a year. There are to appear before the Lord. Passover which is called the bread of affliction. Do you guys realize how long 
unleavened bread is to be celebrated or to be observed? Seven days, correct? Seven days. But there's more detail to it. Remember what I was talking about earlier, and you'll see this connection. What's the other one? We have the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks is, of course, seven Sabbaths that you number from such time as you begin to put the sickle to the corn. Now, here's the thing about this. This is something that has always been a struggle. Because in this, when we read from, <clears throat> from Leviticus, it would appear that it should begin from after a resurrection. And whether you want to do it from the time of resurrection on the 16th or give it that one more week of unleavened bread and then begin the count, it puts us 50 days too early. Because we know that the Feast of Weeks we have proven, and I've got a short video coming out on it as well, proving that the Feast of Weeks is seven Sabbaths, then it's the Feast of Weeks, and you number 50 days, and those are the 50 days to Pentecost. Because the Feast of Weeks and Pentecost are not the same thing. But the question is, where do those seven weeks begin to be counted? But when those seven weeks are over, it's a one-day feast. And then we have what? The Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Boots, which is also a seven, where is it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Which is also, where is it? A seven-day feast. <clears throat> All right? So it's another day feast, a seven-day feast. So we've got seven, one, seven. We've done some great videos on this over the years. Incredible ones. Because a lot of people have wondered about this, this revelation, this, this thing that they've seen throughout the years of 717. We've revealed what 717 is. It's the three feasts of the Lord. Seven days as seven years. One day as one year, or you know the, the pre-trib escape. And seven days as seven years. But that's not the order of how they play out in the end. Because to the Lord God, the Feast of Weeks is the end and the beginning or the beginning of the year. It's the year's end and then the beginning of the year on the following day. He talks about it everywhere. In fact, we can show it. Remember this? Remember when we talked about Enoch? Many, many people have talked about this over the years. Chuck Missler, our dear brother in the Lord, who's with them now, um, has shared on this. But of course, there was still confusion in its understanding. And many, many, many people, this has been shared. I don't know if you guys know this. This has been shared for millenniums. That Enoch is believed to have been taken. He was translated on his birthday. And they believe that he was born and taken on what they would call the 6th of Savan. Now, was it really the 6th of Savan? Right? Let me see if I got just a calendar brought up. Okay. Was, was it really just the 6th of Savan? Well, they call it. So the church with the Jews call the 6th of Savan Feast of Weeks and Pentecost. We've proven that Feast of Weeks and Pentecost are 100% unequivocally separate periods of time that are added together. And like I said, in an upcoming uh, shorts, I, I clearly lay it out in Leviticus chapter 23. And it's very straightforward to understand once you see it. it it's similar to what I was talking about in Revelation um, 9 verse 15 when the angels that were prepared for a day and a, a day and an hour and a month and a year such as this, and yet Mark and Matthew only say day and hour. It didn't say month or year you couldn't know. If it wanted to, it would have said it because we have other places in scripture where it was used. So what would have been the point of not sharing it there if it was shared over there and yet that should have been the same understanding? It's the exact same principle that you find, might as well go to it, <clears throat> in Leviticus 23, okay? 
I'll just touch on it very briefly. What do we know about Passover? It's on the 14th day of the month. When does unleavened bread start? On the 15th day of the month. When does trumpet start? On the uh, first day of the month. When does atonement start? On the 10th day of the month. When does tabernacle start? On the 15th day of the month. So six examples, five or six examples, just right here in the same chapter talking about the feasts. And yet, when you get to Leviticus 23, 16, it says, uh, even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall you number, which also means to score or to count, 50 days, plural. Do you follow? If it was meant to say the 50th day, why does it have an S for plural? And why doesn't it say 50th? Like all the other places it did in scripture. Hello. Because it is a counting of 50 days after the seven Sabbaths. Those 50 days are the 50 days to Pentecost. The Feast of Weeks is the end of the seven Sabbaths. That's why when we go into Deuteronomy 16 and we go to the Feast of Weeks, do you see anything about another 50 days being counted? Do you see a mention of 50th or number 50 days more? No. But what, what happened with the Christians? Why did the church combine the Feast of Weeks with Pentecost? Because they thought it was just the 50th day and Pentecost is 50. But why did they do it? It goes back to the intro video that I was talking about earlier. And it's a fascinating video to dig into because it's all because of Matthew. Because since the time of Christ, like after the apostles and all this stuff, and then the church age was really starting. And it wasn't understood. Everybody for centuries and centuries and centuries have been taught everything gospel founded from Matthew. Even though the church knows it's written to the Jews, to Judah. They kind of little bit know what Mark is written to and don't really know what Luke is written to. But, you know, they maybe had ideas, but they never knew that there was an actual application that was prophetic in those differences. So everything is founded on the foundation of Matthew. So that everything they go look at from beginning of, of the Bible to the end of it, they're only seeing it unbeknownst to them through the perspective of Matthew, which is why they believe everything from creation is only going to be 7,000 years, 6,000 and then 7,000, which is why they believe it's only seven years of tribulation, which is why they believe everybody who believes in Christ is going pre-trib. All of that is the equivalent of being at the end of Mark's gospel. At the end of seals. And this is why it wasn't noticed here, or you don't hear conversations about it. Nothing here about 50. Because the 50 that begins after the seventh Sabbath is the count to Pentecost, which is the time of new wine. There is no such thing as new wine ready at the end of the wheat harvest, which is not spring wheat, but winter wheat. Oh, you're going to see how all this ties up. All of the connections we've been sharing. Okay, so there's your Feast of Weeks, <coughs> which is the time. Now, the Jews believe that the Feast of Weeks is the 6th of Savan. Now, I'm going to show something in here. <clears throat> here's 2024 the jews believe that it's the sixth of savan i don't know why they have the seventh but they believe it's the sixth of savan what we've been talking about is that the the sabbath count begins from like a a passover count in savan okay in the third month and this was a holy ghost uh confirmation revelation so what are we talking about <coughs> excuse me one two 
three, four, five, six, seven Sabbath. This would be your true feast of weeks, but you cannot get to that count if you're counting from the time of resurrection and counting this, the true Sabbaths, which are the 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th of every month. Those are the true Sabbath days. And if you're counting from the barley, you're never going to get to the count. You would end up on the 8th, of Savan. And then you would have 50 more days, which I think takes you to around the 1st of Av or whatever that is, or the 29th of Tammuz. Would it be Tammuz? No. Of Elul, right here, of Av to Elul. Okay. And that doesn't line up with the wheat harvest of the winter wheat, nor does it line up with the end of the grape harvest. So you've got to go to the end of the grape, uh, at the end of the winter wheat, and you've got to go to the end of the grapes so that the two wave loaves can be brought in. You see that? Let me show you. Let's go back into Leviticus 23. This is really the giveaway about understanding when true Feast of Weeks is. Because look at what happens. In Leviticus 23, 17, it says, you shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals, and they shall be a fine flour baked with leaven. They are the first fruits under the Lord. Baked with leaven. Do you guys realize this is something we've shared on before, and I'm going to touch on it again a little as we go for forward. But you have to understand <clears throat> that spring wheat which is what's planted at the time of Passover just after it, when it's harvested at late summer, very early fall, it cannot be used because it is called Yoshon. It is called new wheat. You even see it in the stores of packages with pastas and different things in the stores because it cannot be used until the following year on the second day of Passover or at the beginning of unleavened bread. That is called new wheat and that's the process of using it. Which means how on earth for one is the winter wheat harvest ready in late May to early June? The answer is it's not. It only starts the harvest cycle at this time it's not over until about late july to earlyish august which means if this is actually winter wheat time harvest and the spring wheat harvest doesn't come into later september into october and the spring wheat that's harvested here can't be used until the following year at the 16th of nisan how on earth are two wave loaves from the harvest of wheat being the first fruits used here? Hello. Spring wheat can't even be used yet. The answer is when the winter wheat comes to the end and the harvest is over, this is the time frame. This In this time frame here, every year, is when the winter wheat is ready. And what do they do with the winter wheat? They grind it all up. They make loaves of bread every year at this time of year. And they bring them to the churches in the ancient days. Some places around the world, they still do. At this time of year. Which means we are not talking about the pre-trib connected to spring wheat, but winter wheat. It's connected to the Feast of Weeks so that wave loaves can be brought to the Lord. You cannot have bread baked with any other wheat at the time of the Feast of Weeks when the true Feast of Weeks and the harvest has come in. You follow? First of all, there is no wheat at that time. 
And when the wheat is ready at the true time, that's when they bake it with leaven and they bring it into churches. It's fantastic. It's absolutely incredible to understand. And so what do we know about this? The true, and this is why I keep saying the true. So whatever the true Feast of Weeks is in 2024, which I personally believe will be the time frame of the 12th of August will be the pre-trib. Do I know the day, uh, the hour? No. But do you know what? That's what the Lord said in Luke chapter 12. That, the, that you won't know the hour. But to those that weren't paying attention, when their time comes, they won't know the day or hour. But to that first watch, did not say you wouldn't know the day. <coughs> Excuse me. He said you wouldn't know the hour. Absolutely incredible. Okay. So if Enoch was taken at true feast of weeks, and we know that the calendars, like we said, the sun has gone off by two months and all these teachings over the years, the sun has gone off by two months. And we know that where the Lord God had it in the beginning, because as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Then Sivan to the father is the beginning of months. And the feast of weeks, the true feast of weeks, is the end and the beginning of the year to the Lord. He begins his count still, right? Begins his count in Sivan, but he has a year's end and beginning of the year at the Feast of Weeks. Do you know one of the ways we can prove this? In Genesis chapter 5. This is why I was showing you the days to years, years to days in prophetic typologies. Because Enoch lived to 365 years. You don't think that was prophetic? 365 years to 365 days that we live in? And God took him. So if he was born at the true feast of weeks and was taken at the true feast of weeks and he was 365 years and years are prophetically a picture of days, then he was taken at the end from the beginning and then to the end of the year, 365 days as years later. Why does Enoch make a difference? Why does this, what does this have to do with pointing to Enoch as being pre-trib? And being connected to the Feast of Weeks. Why, why is it Enoch Feast of Weeks? Why, why is Enoch Feast of Weeks and why does it matter in his connection to pre-trip? Well, let's prove out Feast of Weeks a little bit more. What do we have? In Hebrews 11, we see uh, Hebrews 11.5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. This is your pre-trib right here. And was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, is it, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Who diligently seek him. Who comes, what's, what story comes after the pre-trib, Feast of Weeks connection to Enoch. Then we have Noah. What's this picture of Noah? It's the Luke 17 pre-trib. At the time when the Enoch group is taken pre-trib, there's the seven-day Gentile wedding. Remember, there's there how many how many women are are uh, uh, books in the Bible? There's a Gentile and a Jew. There's Ruth and Esther. Who's the Gentile one? Ruth. When do you think Ruth, when do you think her portion was? Do you think maybe it's going to be connected to Enoch's time? Connected to the time of the Feast of Weeks? For which this Noah portion represents the 40 days of the Son of Man? 
And then when the 40 days of the Son of Man are over, like Luke chapter 2 in the picture or, or Isaiah 9, and, and the Son of Man's 40 days are over and he's gone, like the, like the Muslims say, the Dajjal, they'll call him the Antichrist. The world will call him the Antichrist. But we know it's truly the Son of Man here for 40 days warning as he said he would as Jonah. When those 40 days are over, when's the next event? When he's finished the 40 days as the white horse rider, what's, what, what's the next event when he comes? At the end of seals. At the end of seals to bring in the house of Israel, the world and Gentiles grafted in for the great multitude rapture. What do we know takes place during those seven years of seals while the Jews have been removed and World War III and the, and the, and the, the, the six years of seals are taking place? What do we know happens? We know at some point in the midst of it, the foundation in Jerusalem is going to get rebuilt by the modern day Zerubbabel. And look what happens when we now look at the third person in Hebrews 11 here from Enoch. This is a picture of the end of seals, that seventh year time frame, when the rapture is going to come. And listen to what it says. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went not out, knowing whither he went. Listen to this. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, and their heirs uh, with him of the same promise. Now listen to this, verse 10. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Well, how about that? When do the foundations get laid? During seals, only the foundations will get laid. Everything will then get rebuilt in the first half of trumpets. When is he coming? At a point after the foundation had been laid in that city. That's the end of seals. That's seventh year time of seals. And then when the Lord returns at the end, what's this picture of the Lord returning? It's when he comes to start that 21st or 14th year. And he's here and it's the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. We see it's Gen it's John 21 or it's John, uh, um, excuse me, Genesis 21. All right. We have this in what we, the, the, what we were talking about earlier, these chapters to years that reveal events within their chapters that prophetically give us understanding to the end. And we see that it's, lined up with Genesis chapter 21. And so what do, we, what do we know after, now he's come at the end of seals. He was here during that year of rest. The temple is being rebuilt. Zerubbabel is there. Jesus is high priest and king, Melchizedek. And, and Zerubbabel, they're ruling together as, as uh, Zechariah 6 tells us. And the city and the streets are rebuilt. And the Lord, as high priest and, and, and king, is leading the 144. And then at mid-trumpets, about three and a half years in, he's cut off. And when he returns at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, or the 14th year at the end of 13, and the beginning of that 14th year or seventh year of trumpets, the whole world is going to see him. As that seventh trumpet sounds, it's now the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. And look at what we see. Through faith, this is the fourth one now. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and deliver a child. She brings forth Isaac. When does Isaac show up in scripture? Do you know where it is? Chapter 21 of Genesis. Right here, chapter 21 of Genesis. Let's go have a look. Let's go have a look. Chapter 21 of Genesis. Abraham's now 100 years old. What was he when he had his first child? 86, 14 years later. Oh my goodness. 
And right at the start of the chapter, like the start of the 14th year, she conceives and bear a son, Isaac. This stuff is over the top. This is why I'm trying to tell you guys, we've understood. Pre-trib, 40 days of the Son of Man. Oops, where is it? Hebrews 11. So we've got pre-trib Enoch, 40 days of the Son of Man, the return of the great multitude rapture at the time of the end of seals, where they, when they see the foundations in the city, because only foundations were laid during seals, and then at the end, at the start of the 14th year, Sarah bringing Isaac the promise. His return, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Pre-40 days, mid-post. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. So what was the point with this one with Enoch? Again, Enoch came first. Enoch's first before everything else we know of the 40 days of the Son of Man, the, the mid-seal, the, the, the mid-tribulation at the end of seals, and the post-tribulation at the end of trumpets. Starts off with Enoch. When was Enoch taken? True Feast of Weeks. What was it? 365 years to 365 days. We even see this stuff in the Book of Jubilees. All right? You guys remember this from the Book of Jubilees? We see this picture of the old grain. Remember that? Came to pass in the third month, came by the well of oath. He offered a sacrifice to, uh, to the God of his father, Isaac, on the seventh of this month. And while he was thinking that he would send word to Joseph that he should come to him and that he would not go down, he remained seven days. So you've got that seventh, eighth day picture, which is the beginning of 50 days. Okay, that, that true third month in the picture of what it was like in the beginning, starting from Savannah's month one. And you've got the seven day wedding. And then look what happens. And he celebrated the festival of first fruits of old grain. Old grain. Why old grain? What does old grain have to do with anything? Something we've shared on many, many times and we were just talking about a little while ago. Spring wheat is not ready until late summer, early fall. When it is harvested, the Jews do not use it because it is called new wheat. It is called new grain. It was planted after Passover. It didn't take root until shortly after Passover which means when it's harvested, they cannot just take it and grind it up and start baking bread with leaven. It's called new wheat. It cannot be used until the second day of Passover or the beginning of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. Who was the new wheat? We've taught on this many times. Who is the new wheat? In the picture of Leah and Rachel. Rachel was. Who did Jesus get? Uh, who did um, Jacob get first? Even though he wanted Rachel. The younger one and prettier one. Who did he get? The older, more loyal one. He didn't get the, the new wheat, spring wheat first. He got the winter wheat first. The winter wheat is, is sown late fall. And clearly has taken root before Passover so that when it's harvested latest summer, mid-late summer, actually, yeah, about mid summer, when it's harvested, it can be used right away. And the difference between spring wheat and winter wheat is spring wheat in the Hebrew is called Yoshon and winter wheat is called Kadosh. But spring wheat can be called Kadosh, but not until the following year on the second day of Passover, the beginning of unleavened bread. Winter wheat is Leah, old, not because it's rotten, just older. Spring wheat is new because it's younger, 
That's all there is to it. <clears throat> and look, this I've shared over the years as well. It's all talked about in this here. See, Kadosh is defined in Torah as grains of uh, uh, barley, all these things, wheat. Any of the grains took root before Passover, became Yoshon after the second day. You see? Any of these grains that took root before Passover become Yoshon after the second day of Passover. Okay? Where, where is it more clearly for you guys? If one of these grains missed the plant, this planting deadline, then it is considered as having been planted too late to be Yoshon for this year. This grain will be harvested several months later. From the time of its harvest, typically late July, August. No, it's actually later, as we saw, because it's spring wheat. Until Passover, the following year, the grain is called Kadosh. You see? Guys, we've understood these things. It's Leah and it's Rachel. Leah is like Enoch. First, Feast of Weeks, 365 days. Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Weeks. Are you ready for something crazy now? Check this out. Let me show you what I clicked on. I clicked on Shavuot, okay? This is not Pentecost. We know it's the Feast of Weeks. Okay, as you see right there, Feast of Weeks. Is it this time or even to here? I do not believe so. As I just explained and I've explained in many other videos, I believe the true count of counting Savan as month one to the Lord God is where the count of the Passover forward goes because as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. So what happens? What I believe it brings us to is that true Shavuot feast of weeks, not Pentecost, feast of weeks is actually the eighth of Av on the Hebrew calendar. We have shown this and explained it so many different ways. And we have shown it by the wheat, winter wheat harvest. And we have shown it by the new grapes, which is Pentecost, which is always mid September to early October. Over and over and over again, it's actually connected to right before that time frame of the Feast of Trumpets. It's literally when the new wine is ready, when the grapes have been harvested. There are no grapes. <laughs> there is no grape harvest in June. Never. Doesn't exist. So when I'm pointing to here to show you the Feast of Weeks, I'm not doing it to say because I believe the Feast of Weeks is there. I believe true Feast of Weeks, the seventh Sabbath and the pre-trib escape is right in here. Okay? But now what I'm going to do is we've seen Enoch, we've seen the pre, we've seen the mid, we've seen the post, we, we've seen where the connections are. We can show the connections to 2024, and we've got a, a, a near-death or a death experience and was told 2024, we've got a brother who heard clearly from the Lord, whose reputation is on the line, to three quarters of a million subscribers, that the Lord clearly told him one year and everything drastically changes. And we can biblically prove the 14 years and that when the 70 years are over, it's the year of the Lord of, of his vengeance. So, when we look at Shavuot, true Shavuot, down here in 2024, who else was I mentioning earlier that has a connection to Shavuot or to Feast of Weeks? Check this out. You want to see what they read from at Feast of Weeks? The Megillah. Only the Megillah is added on the Feast of Weeks only. It means in addition to the a complete additional two reading 
that they do only at the Feast of Weeks. How many, how many books by women are in the Bible? Ruth and Esther. Ruth and Esther. Everybody knows Esther is Jewish and everybody knows Ruth is Gentile. What's the story of Ruth, brothers and sisters? She married her kinsman redeemer, did she not? I always like this. In Ruth chapter 2, verse 10. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger? See, adulteress. That's just a, one of those Jewish uh, uh, um, <clears throat> words for a Gentile, like dog, right? Why have you taken such an interest and had grace of me? And she's, he becomes the kinsman redeemer. Everybody in church knows this story of the Gentile bride of the Christ type of the kinsman redeemer as Boaz. And Boaz answered and said unto her, it hath fully been shown to me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband. Verse 12, Ruth 2, 12. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward. Sound familiar? Sound like Enoch? And believe that the Lord was a rewarder of those who diligently sought him? And a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wing, wings thou art come to trust. How about this? How about this? <coughs> Ruth 2.21. Ruth the Moabite has said, he said unto me, thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. What is the end of the harvest? Verse 23. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley and of the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Do you get it? Do you know that the barley and the wheat are the two that are planted late fall that take root before Passover and then grow from early spring into summer and mid-later mid -later, mid -later summer or midish summer? This is what I've shared in the past, that from barley with the green ears of corn being ready to its harvesting time, which takes about two months and takes you to about some time in Savan, about midish Savan. Well, at about the time of the beginning of Savan is when the winter wheat, which was planted at the same time as the barley, starts to get harvested. There is an overlap of give or take about two weeks of overlap. So as barley comes to an end, winter wheat begins and it takes about one, two months. And she was told to stay to the end of the barley and the wheat harvest. Where's the end of the wheat harvest? Right here, when they take that winter wheat, grind it up, and bake bread with leaven. You see why it's so important? And what was the piece of scripture that the Jews read at the Feast of Weeks as the complete reading called the Megillah? It is the book of Ruth. Remember I was telling you, uh, our brother Chris had shared something and then Al Stewart had found something else. And then as I was looking, I found more connections with what they had shared. And then just today, I thought, you know what? Man, I, I should keep going. I should look to see if there's something connected to, Pent uh, to the Feast of Weeks. 
And I went and looked to see what they read at the Feast of Weeks. And I said, what? I think I knew this years ago. I completely forgot. So we've got Enoch, who we've proven. We've got Ruth, who the whole world knows. We have the harvests and the difference between winter and spring proven and historically documented and factually happening in our modern day and age in the exact season and time to the 8th of Av and then 50 more days to Pentecost at the day before the Feast of Trumpets. When it just so happens those 50 days are over and we know that the attack on Jerusalem will begin at the Feast of Trumpets at the Red Horse Rider, which will begin the six years of seals and the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation. So that when the six years are over of the first six years of seals, it's the Ezekiel 39 war at the end of that sixth year. And the seventh year is a year of rest. But when we go to seven years of trumpets, it's not six years and then the seventh year of rest. It's six years and then the seventh year is devastation against all the enemies while his people are protected. But there's all this devastation because he's now got to clean up the earth for this place prepared for that final wedding, which will then happen when that 14th year, that final year is over, which wasn't a year of rest, which will also end at the Feast of Trumpets, then have a 10 days to the, to the blowing of the shofar for the Jubilee, for which then tabernacles and the seven-day wedding will take place. You'll see why I'm reiterating this. I hope this is clear for you guys. I hope you can now see and understand for yourselves. 100% unequivocally, the pre-trib bride of Christ will be taken at true feast of weeks. In the year I believe will be 2024 from all the additional revelation that revealed the count of the end of days and the years. And now we add those two videos that we shared earlier. Well, let's keep going. Let's take it a step further. Let's go back. Let's go back now to Deuteronomy 16. So remember, when we shared on this mystery and revealed the mystery of Deuteronomy, the three times to the Lord, the picture is 717. And it's the mystery that many people have been seeing. It almost looks like, like uh, yod heh vav -Hey. Okay, take the Yod out, but then it looks like 7, comma, 1, 7 when you look at yod heh vav -Hey from right to left. And people have seen it. If you go to 717, in fact, watch this. You go to 717 in the Hebrew, 717 in the Hebrew, look at this. It's only used twice. One means to gather, the other means to pluck. Gather is the pre-trip, pluck is the mid-trip. What, what, what is it? 717. It's the story of Deuteronomy. Except Deuteronomy does not play out as 717. It plays out at the beginning, like Enoch at the Feast of Weeks, pre-trib, Bride of Christ, Ruth, Feast of Weeks. Then it's the seven years as the seven days. That's why I was showing you, right? Prophetically, days can be years. Years can be days. We just shared it with Enoch. Now we're taking it to seals. The seven years of seals are the pictures, uh, is the picture of the seven days of unleavened bread. And it's even called the bread of affliction. Trouble, affliction, depression. Do you know what that is? 
tribulation. Because it is giving us a prophetic picture of the seven years of seals. But you ready for this? This is going to start to blow your mind when you see the precision in the revelation of it. Because unleavened bread isn't simply seven days. You guys know that, right? As you've, as you've searched out these things. <laughs> right? So it's not just seven years, seven days as seven years. Right? What did we say would happen? It'll go from the red horse rider beginning and it'll end at the end of the sixth seal. So from the second seal to the sixth seal. And when the sixth year is over, it's the destruction uh, in the in the Ezekiel 39 war. And then what happens? This is why I was telling you guys earlier. What happens in this seventh year? It's a year of rest. The enemies were destroyed. Antichrist was killed. The rest had their dominion taken away. Whole bunch of people were killed. It's the it, it's the Revelation 17 war. Came to an end. That Revelation 17 war ended at the end of the sixth year. And then what do we see? Just, just like we were reading in 2nd Ezra. And then what happens? Then it's the year of rest. We saw that the year of rest was the 144, the great multitude rapture, and then the seventh seal, which is called a, a half hour of silence in heaven which I believe is the revelation of about six months of this one year, about maybe five, maybe six, maybe seven, <coughs> excuse me, about six months, which means the first half of the seventh year when the 144,000 are sealed and the great multitude rapture comes in, <coughs> excuse me, was the about five, six, seven months of the first half of the seventh year. So there's no war. There's no more battles. It's a year of rest. They've seen the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the mountain prepared. Like he said he would do when he left. <clears throat> Remember? Watch how fascinating this is. You're going to see when we go back into this, you're going to see this connection to stuff with Genesis and so forth in this chapters to years conversation. But let me show you something else. John chapter 14. John has 21 chapters as well. That's for a reason. And there's a reason why only John's gospel. So you have the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the resurrection story is found at the last chapter of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. But in John, it's found in chapter 20. Because it's a picture of something that happens at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. At the end of the sixth trumpet. That takes place. It's mind-blowing. But let me show you something else. When did, when did Jesus tell us in John, in which chapter did Jesus tell us that he has to go and prepare a place for them, that when he returns, he will receive them unto himself, that where he is, they may be also? Well, I, just, I was just showing you that in this seventh year of seals, he was seen coming at the very end, had the battle now in the seventh year, about the midst of this seventh year, which is the year of rest, is when he's going to gather them to the mountain of the Lord as the great multitude rapture from Revelation chapter seven. So what year is that? Well, in the big picture of the 21 years, as you see right here, seven, 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 what do we have? This would be the 14th year. What if we go to John chapter 14 and let's see what it says and see if it lines up. <clears throat> John 14, starting verse two. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Do you realize that's the same context? that we read here when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion after they, he came 
and a great multitude gathers to come against them and he destroys them. There he is standing on Mount Zion and he comes with what? A place prepared and built. This place prepared and furnished or prepared and built is only found in the Passover story of Mark chapter 13, 13 or 14. Only in Mark's does it say prepared and furnished. Why? Because when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion, the place prepared, a mountain carved without hands, he's coming with paradise. Their places will be prepared in it. What is that going to look like? I have no idea. But if you look and read the end of the sixth seal, everybody's freaking out, hiding in caves and mountains, telling them to fall on them. So pay attention here. Six years and the seventh is a rest year with those events mentioned that will take place. Then it is seven years of seals to which he returns at the end of the sixth and starts again at the Feast of Trumpets for the seventh year. But that seventh year of trumpets, judgment, is not a year of rest. It is the day of the Lord, the year of his vengeance. It's not a rest like this one was. Are you ready? Check this out. You want to talk about understanding these things, guys? It's going to blow your mind. We've covered the first one. Now we're going to the seven days as seven years, the bread of affliction, the time of seals. But do you know how the seven days as years play out or the seven days as unleavened bread play out? Are you ready for this? Deuteronomy 16, 8. Six days. Wait, what? Six years shall thou eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day, on the seventh year, shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord God. An assembly, a meeting <clears throat> to prevail or recover. Six days and the seventh is a solemn assembly and rest. There is no tribulation in the seventh year as there was in the sixth. Who is connected to the great multitude rapture of the second day of Passover, which is unleavened bread. The new wheat. The new wheat. It's the new wheat, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> it's the spring wheat. It's the spring wheat that is planted after the time of Passover. So it never took root before Passover. So when it is ready and it is being harvested in late summer, early fall, it cannot be ground and processed and used until about, what, six months later? About the middle of the seventh year? On the second day of Passover or the beginning of unleavened bread to the group who is representative of the seven days as years for unleavened bread, the bread of affliction? <clears throat> when does the Lord come? He destroys them at the end of the sixth and there he is what? It's the beginning of trumpets. The 14 years begins at the Feast of Trumpets. The six years end the day before trumpets, and the seventh year begins at the, fe at the Feast of Trumpets. So it starts the 14th Feast of Trumpets. The end of the sixth is just before the Feast of Trumpets. There's the beginning of the seventh year, Feast of Trumpets. It's one year, 
then it begins at the Feast of Trumpets when the Lord returns and he's seen feet down on the Mount of Olives. So you see, day and hour no one knows in Mark. They didn't get to go right away. They will have seen it coming like the world did at the end of the sixth seal. At the day and hour no one knows. Bang, Feast of Trumpets. And then one year. And then Trumpets judgment begins at the Feast of Trumpets. And when those six years of trumpets are over, or the 13th year of tribulation is over, it'll be over and he'll be coming at Matthew's day and hour no one knows and he'll be here to start the seventh year, the day of the Lord, the year of his vengeance at the Feast of Trumpets. And when this year is over, which is the year like Enoch from Matthew 24, which is a year and 10 days, it'll be over at Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets. And on the 10th day, there'll be a shofar blast to announce the Jubilee. And what happens when this time of this 14th is over and the trumpet blast takes place? It's the seven-day wedding of tabernacles for the, for the uh, uh, um, Esther type. The Jewish wedding. Two books, one Gentile, one Jew. Two weddings, one in Luke, one in Matthew. So, Mark said, they see him coming and it's the day and hour no one knows. Here he comes, day and hour no one knows, feast of trumpets, and it lasts for one year, which means He's going to show up at the Feast of Trumpets, and this would be what? Feast of Trumpets 2030 to just before, like to a little 29, okay? We'll just say Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, but really Feast of Trumpets starts the next year, right? So Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, one year. It will begin at Feast of Trumpets 2030, <clears throat> but they don't go right away, right? They don't go till unleavened bread of the following year. He even said it. Six days and on, or because it's not a day, it's a year in the typology, in the seventh year is the solemn assembly. And even though he came at the end of the sixth, we know that there's several months. And guess what? The Ezekiel 39 war, the Ezekiel 39 war that took place at the end of the sixth year, when it's over, what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to be burying bodies. How long does it say the bodies will take to get buried? Seven months? Didn't we just say it's between five and seven months? For the rapture of the great multitude to actually come in from when they seen him come? Interesting. Right in the wheelhouse. <coughs> they go, but they still got to bury. Something's going on there. And then you got what? Then you've got another five, six, seven months for the seventh seal to play out. And it'll be the end of the seven years of seals and the first year of the trumpet judgments begins at the Feast of Trumpets. <laughs> this gets even better. I'm not done yet. <clears throat> See how awesome that was? <clears throat> Wait, oh man, my throat is scratchy like crazy. It was bugging me today. But I ain't stopping. This is so powerful it is so exciting it is so awesome i want people to understand it this is the revelation of the end of days 100 percent, the revelation of the end of days the only question is what year will it all begin i believe 2024 i believe it with all of my heart and with every piece of revelation we've been given have i been wrong before Yep, with everybody else over the last 2,000 years. But over 2,000 years, nobody had Israel come back into the land. 
Nobody was able to point to 70 years from when they captured Jerusalem and had it all in almost 2,000 years. Hello. We are the final generation. We are the final generation. <coughs> Remember this, guys. For those that tell you there's no pre-trib, oh, it's not happening, we're all staying till the end. Here's what you tell them. Then how will you know it's the end of days? If World War III started and nothing changed, there was no pre-trib, how would you know it's the end of days? I've, I've spoken on this a, lot, uh, a few times in the past. How would you know? How would anybody know if it's the true end of days? How would there be this huge revival if it was just World War III? And I mean just meaning there was World War II, there was World War I. World War III would simply be another world war, just this time much greater. What says that it has to be the end of days? It wasn't for one, it wasn't for two. But it's pretty interesting, isn't it? Because everything happens in threes. Isn't that what we're looking at right here? Everything happens in threes. <clears throat> so without a pre-trib and tens of millions of people vanishing, how would anybody know? It would just be hunker down, prep, try to save your family and do what you can. It's not the case. The pre-trib is 100% true. It is 100% going to happen at the true Feast of Weeks in the correct year, which I believe is 2024. These six days as years will end at the time of the Feast of Weeks. Uh, uh, sorry, at the Feast of Trumpets of 2030. And the seventh day is the seventh year. In the midst of it is the time of the great multitude rapture. Oh, we're going to go to Tabernacles in a moment. But let's finish up like we did with the Feast of Weeks. Let's go take this and have a look to see what the Jews read at the Feast of Trumpets. Because this is going to end at the Feast of Trumpets, right? And the seventh year starts the seventh year at the Feast of Trumpets. But they don't get raptured until Passover of the following year, which would be 2031. So when you see this chart, which chart is it? Was it on this one? Oh, this one. So when you see it here, you see, it's the spring of 31. It might be too small for you. But it's the spring of 31. All of these charts are linked in the videos below, or you can find them all updated, all current on ministryrevealed.com or in the description box below, as well as a little write-up of the end of days for it. So you see, the fall, Feast of Trumpets, the seventh year begins. About the midst of this final seventh year is the great multitude rapture, spring of 2031. Okay? So it's going to put you... Right in here at the Feast of Passover of 2031. But he came on heavenly Mount Zion. He destroyed the enemies. And there he is to start the seventh year at the Feast of Trumpets of 2030. But the great multitude rapture is about six months later. Actually, seven months makes a lot of sense. Because we know, I've talked about this in the past, but I almost forgot. We know that um, there is a second Passover, right? There's a second Passover one month later, which would make it what? Seven months. How long are they burying the bones before? Seven months. From the Feast of Trumpets, 2030, to second Passover, 2031, is... The precise number of months from the end of the sixth seal at the end of the Ezekiel 39 war, seven months to burying the bones at second Passover. But it's still as what? 
it would be at Passover, whether it's the first or the second, it's connected to the second day of Passover, which is unleavened bread. Okay? Remember, they're traveling from far distances as well. We read about all these things. Well, let's let's take it a step further. Because here is Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets in 2030. Now, these are readings that they do at every Feast of Trumpets. I'm just taking it to the year of the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, just so that you get a, a more clear picture, okay? This is when he's seen coming at the end of the sixth seal, and then, bang, the seventh year is starting at Rosh Hashanah, 2030, the day and hour no one knows. And let's see what they read from. Oh, don't you worry. It's going to blow your mind. But I'm not going to the other ones yet. I'm going to this one right here. They read the half Torah. I think it's like the half Torah. It almost sounds like half the way through, right? It's not, but it's called the half Torah. Half Torah. They read from Jeremiah 31. So just as it was awesome, that at the pre-trib, they read from Ruth, the Gentile bride, at the Feast of Weeks, at the Feast of Trumpets, they're reading from Jeremiah 31. <clears throat> Are you ready to get blown away, especially newer people? Do you know what it tells us in Jeremiah 31? Let's have a read. Jeremiah 31 is a picture of the end of the six years of seals and the time of when the rapture is going to take place in that seventh year. We've shared this before, and one of our sisters shared uh, two or three years ago, shared the Septuagint, the original first translation into, oh, is it from the Hebrew to the Greek, of Jeremiah and what it said. If you haven't seen this before, your jaw is about to hit the floor. Jeremiah 31, let's start in verse 2. Thus saith the Lord God, the people which are left of the sword. Huh. The people which are left of the sword. That was the sword. That was during seals. It might even be connected. So we know the great sword is given at the red horse rider. That's when nation against nation goes against each other. And we also know that the first sword of the Lord is the Ezekiel 39 battle at the end of the six years of seals. So the people which are left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. Do you realize? Do you realize that when nation against nation begins and people are freaking out, there's wanderings that take place. Do you know that for the, the, the war, the... The World War III will last, come on now, will last for about two and a half years of the first two and a half years of the 14th. Antichrist will get his power that will last for 42 months during the second half, approximately second half of seals. This is when the Mark discourse and there to flee to the wilderness, the first abomination of desolation, which is the mark of the beast, uh, worshiping him, his number, his name. This is when it begins, and they flee into the wilderness. Okay? And what is it saying? Those that are left of the sword that found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause them to rest. Verse 4, Jeremiah 31, 4. Again will I build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabarets, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Verse 6, for there shall be a day that the watchman upon the Mount of Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion, to Mount Zion, you're going to see, unto the Lord our God. For thus saith the Lord, sing with gladness for joy, uh, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish, thee, publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant the remainder, the surviving portion of Israel. Now, you ready for this? Behold, I will bring them forth 
from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth. And with them, the blind and the lame and the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together, a great company shall return thither. Do you know what a great company means? The word company in Hebrew is 6951, which means multitude. And I will bring the great multitude. So is he bringing them yet? No. The mountain of the Lord is now here. There's going to be a cry by the watchman from Ephraim saying, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Do you remember this mountain of the Lord? In Zechariah chapter 8, which is the first year. So that was a picture of the start of the seventh year of seals, which is represented seven years of seals. And here's the beginning of trumpets in Zechariah chapter 8. And what is it? The Lord is no longer jealous. And it says in Zechariah 8, 3, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. See, this is what came at the end of the sixth seal. This is where the great multitude rapture is going, to the mountain of the Lord, the holy mountain of the Lord. They're going <clears throat> to the place prepared that he came to receive them too. But they're not doing it when they see him at trumpets. A call is going to go out from somebody in the tribe of Ephraim. One of the workers during seals, P.S. As we've shared, it was it's Ephraim and Dan, which represent the workers of seals through the Priscilla's and Aquila's and Smyrna and all that stuff. A cry goes out from Mount Ephraim, let us arise and go unto Zion. So this is the call at the end of the sixth seal to start the seventh year of seals during that time of the assembly, that, that year of rest, and there to go now to the Lord. It's going to be the remnant, the surviving of his people, and the group is called a great company or a great multitude. Who is the great multitude? You already know it, right? It's the great multitude, which no man can number, which is the great multitude rapture in the midst of the seventh year of seals. But, but this doesn't say anything about trumpets, right? Well, no, it doesn't say trumpets, but it's telling you that there's a call, a shout that's going to go out to tell them it's time to go to the mountain of the Lord. He's there. We saw him coming. We saw this mountain of the Lord come and everybody was freaking out. That battle is over. Now we're going. And he's going to bring in all of the people, the remnant of Israel, which includes the Gentiles grafted in. And it's going to be a great multitude. So when is this? The warning's going to go out sometime at around trumpets, the feast of trumpets. Because that's when he was seen coming, destroyed the enemy. The seventh year starts at the feast of trumpets. The call's going out. So when is this great multitude going to come in? Well, I've just been proving to you in Deuteronomy that it's going to be at the time of Passover or day one of unleavened bread, the second day of Passover. Just like spring wheat. It starts at trumpets, the feast of trumpets time, but they will not be observed or all brought in until the second day of Passover or the start of unleavened bread. Can I prove it? Check this out. Let's go to the Septuagint of Jeremiah chapter 31, the original translation. Listen to what it says. Jeremiah 38, verse 8. See, Jeremiah, sorry, Jeremiah 31. It, it's translated in 38 in relation to Jeremiah, but it's Jeremiah 31, verse 8. Listen carefully and Get your mind blown if you're new. Behold, I bring them from the north, and I will gather them from the end of the earth to the feast of Passover. To the feast of Passover. And the people shall beget a great multitude, and they shall return hither. When? Passover. Passover. 
Who's the only one connected to Passover? Mark's group, the great multitude, the world, the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in, the sleeping church, it, the, those that will take part in the greatest revival in human history in the midst of chaos. The rapture's coming in the midst of the seventh year. Even though it ends at trumpets, that, that sixth year and that seventh year starts at trumpets. They don't come in fully till Passover of the following year. Exactly 100% as the harvest reveal. In this 50-day portion that comes first, I have shown you that when the winter wheat harvest is over and they bring bread in is literally late July to mid-August. 50 days later in mid-September to early uh, into early uh, October is literally when new wine is brought in. And after six years at the Feast of Trumpets in the midst of the seven, after the spring wheat is now ready, it cannot be observed or be used or brought in or recognized until the following year in the midst of the seventh year at Passover, exactly as the harvest. You understand why this is so incredible? You understand why, why we can be more bold when we understand? We've been given the revelation, the open book, the prophetic understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ's end of days. Everything? No, of course not. Every detail? No, of course not. But more than ever been given and revealed in human history? Absolutely, 100%. So much so that the prophets of old didn't even know these mysteries within their own writings. That's how much we've been given. It's proven. It's proven. It's only a matter of when it starts. Well, now it gets, let's go to the next one. Watch this. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the final seven years of tribulation. The seven years. So we've got our pre-feast of weeks. Enoch, Ruth, Gentile bride, Leah, winter week connection, feast of weeks. Then we've got the seven days as years of seals as bread of affliction, as unleavened bread, which is actually six days as years. And then the seventh is for the solemn assembly, that, that time uh, uh, we call it rest, but this solemn assembly, which will be in the midst, which is connected to the Rachel type, which is the one, which are the ones going to paradise, which are the ones that he went to prepare a place for, which are the spring wheat, harvested at the time of Feast of Trumpets and a little bit later and not observed or used until Passover. And then we finish that seventh year of seals <coughs> with the half hour of rest, which I believe, as I said, is about six months, but I believe that's the time when the Lord will make a covenant with all nations. We see it in Daniel chapter seven. Okay, the people will come to him and everything else. There's going to be a, a, a um, there's going to be his covenant being made. Okay, that's when he said what that he's going to do a new thing. In fact, when we go back to Jeremiah 31, we know that this time is connected to now when he's there on Mount Zion. We now know that it's going to be the Feast of Trumpets, and look at what happens. Even in verse 10. Hear the word of the, Jeremiah 31, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O you nations, and declare in the isles far off and say, he that scattered Israel will gather them and keep them as a shepherd does his flock. Great multitude rapture of the church. Verse 12, listen to this. Therefore, ye shall come and sing in the height of the Mount of Olives? Nope. Zion, Zion, 
and thou shalt flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and the herd, and their soul shall be watered, uh, shall be as a watered garden. Why? Because paradise is connected to the garden. It is the garden, right? So when the when the the end of seals comes, he's coming on the mountain carved without hand, the place prepared paradise, the garden. When trumpets then begins, whatever that's going to look like, I don't know how it sits above the mountains and the clouds. I don't know what it's going to look like. But paradise, it, it's going to be there. And it's the garden. Check it out. Watch this. Watch this. Let's go back into our chapter series. Look at John. Okay. So we saw when he brought them to the place prepared. So when you go to chapter 15, now the garden, right? Paradise should be established there. Do you know that in John chapter 15 is the first place we read about the word garden? It's the first place. He's the vine. Is it 15 or 14? Where is it? Where is it? It's it's awesome. Where is it? I sent another comforter. Oh, now I lost my track. But he talks about being, oh, maybe it's a little bit further. Anyways, it's only in John when you see the garden. So here's, there's mid trumpets now at chapter 18, which was in the garden. He's talking about the garden because the garden was there. And now Judas comes to betray him. And this is a picture of when Messiah is cut off at mid trumpets. This is the place where garden shows up. And I believe it's for the first time. Let me check. I want to make sure I've got this right. Watch this. And I believe only in, there you go, John 18, 18, and 19. There's a brief mention in Luke, and there is a purpose to it, but 18, 18, and 19. So you have this connection there to the garden in the midst of what we would call See, John 18, when, when Judas comes in the chapters to years and Judas comes, this is a picture of when Satan is cast down, the pit is opened, and this is when Messiah is cut off. And then Satan has his two and a half years that we spoke about earlier before the Lord comes at the end of the 20th, start of the 21st year or the 14th, and it's the day of the Lord, the year of his vengeance. It's, it's so incredible. But... Let me let me get back on track. Let me get back on track. So back to Deuteronomy 16. Now we have these two covered, pre-trib, mid-trib, done deal. Now we have seven years of trumpets. The seven years of trumpet judgments, for which it is not six years, and then the seventh is a gathering rest. Do you remember what happens? It's about three and a half years of the rebuilding the city and the streets during the first half of trumpets, including the temple. Messiah is cut off and Satan is cast down like Revelation 12. And he's going to be given like Daniel 12, two and a half years. But when this cutting off happens at about mid trumpets, it's the Matthew chapter 24 abomination of desolation, which is standing in the holy place. The first one in Mark was the mark of the beast because the temple of the people is the temple of God. But in midst of trumpets, in the midpoint of trumpets, it's the actual temple that was rebuilt. Now, Satan is going to have two and a half years of the final three and a half. What happens to the people when they're cut off to flee to the wilderness? They fly on the wings of an eagle for the final time and times and half a time. That's one plus two plus a half. Whereas Daniel was missing an and, which means one, two and a half. So it's only two and a half. So they're there till the end, until this final year is over. And then he'll gather them back at the Jubilee sounding trumpet and they'll return and they will all receive their lands. That's a trumpet story. But you see, it's not like seals 
where it's six years and then the seventh is a gathering and rest and so forth. No. There's destruction and devastation against all the enemies of the Lord in that final 14th year. So it doesn't play six and then one. It plays out seven and then one for the new beginning of the Jubilee and the millennial reign. Well, let's read what it says about the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. Deuteronomy 16, 13. Thou shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. After that, thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine, um, and thou shalt rejoice in thy feast, thou and thy sons and thy daughters and thy manservants and thy maidservants, and the Levites, the stranger, those that are within their gates. Seven days shalt thou keep a solemn feast. Did you hear that? Seven days. Not six and then one. It's a full seven days. Do you understand how fascinating that is? How perfectly aligned it is to the revelation we've been sharing for years? Six years. And the Lord destroys them at the end of the sixth year. And the seventh year, he's here. But it's like this rest and preparation time. 144, rapture, the, the, the seventh seal, a time of silence. And then seven years of trumpets. All of it connected with devastation going on, especially against the enemy in the final one. A full seven, not six and then one. And what are the feasts telling us? Six and then one, and then a full seven for tabernacles. Well, do you know the story of tabernacles? Let's go to Leviticus 23. Do you know what happens at the end of tabernacles? Tabernacles or Feast of Booths is a seven day feast, right? And then what does it say? Leviticus 23 36. Seven days thou shalt offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And on the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. And you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord as it is a solemn assembly. So what do we have? From unleavened bread as the seven days as years for seals we have six days as years and then the seventh day as years as the rest and the solemn assembly then we have the seven days as years of the feast of tabernacles not six but seven and on the eighth day is the solemn assembly the final jubilee new beginning? If you think you don't realize that you have the revelation given, you're not following. You're not paying attention. The entire revelation that we have revealed over the 14th to the 15th year being the final jubilee and new beginning is a 100% picture from the 50 days to the start of tribulation, to the end of seals, to the start of trumpets, to the end of trumpets, and the beginning of jubilee, it is the 15 or 14 years and 15th. It is the seven days of unleavened bread, the seven days of tabernacles, and the 15th is the eighth day new beginning from tabernacles. Are you hearing it? Are you really receiving it? We have the revelation of pre, mid, and post. And if it all begins at the Feast of Weeks in 2024, then all of this will be precisely in those years as well. Oh, let, let's just make sure. We're, let, let's just really make sure we're getting this. Okay? Watch this. We saw Feast of Trumpets, right? Uh, uh, sorry, Feast of Trumpets. So when the sixth year comes to an end, then it's the Feast of Trumpets that starts the seventh year of Trumpets, right? The day of the Lord, the year of his vengeance, okay? Just like what? Just like Zechariah 14. Uh, it's like uh, Luke 419 when Jesus proclaims the Jubilee is next, right? When that year comes to an end. 
Uh, it's Isaiah 34, 8, Isaiah 61, 2. This all comes after the 70 years are complete for Jerusalem. And this is the crushing of the vine gra- of the of the wine of the grapes which is the revelation 19 when he's all uppercase king of kings and lord of lords at the treading of the grapes at the end of this battle who are the first two cast into the pit the beast and the false prophet how is it the beast came back i thought the beast was killed at the end in the ezekiel 39 war he was But when the pit was opened by Satan at mid-trumpets, he comes back with everything else that comes out of the pit. As bad as the tribulation of seals are going to be with the Antichrist, and Mark tells us it's going to be worse than it was since, since, uh, you know, whatever it was, uh, creation. The one in Matthew says this time at mid-trumpets is going to be worse than anything that ever was before it at any point, but it'll never be ever this bad again. The pit opens at mid-trumpets. And it's when the beast returns. The false prophet wasn't killed. He had his dominion taken away. That's why at the end of it, when they're destroyed, there's the beast and the false prophet there. And they're the first two thrown into the lake of fire. Whereas Satan is bound now for a thousand years until the millennial reign is over. Then. When that thousand years, the 7,000 is over, poof, the Lord God will end them with a flame and all those gathered against. Okay? So, what were we seeing? We saw this now. There are full seven, then the eighth day is the assembly. Oh, my goodness, that's so awesome. Well, as I was saying, it gets even better because watch this. Here's the Feast of Trumpets, okay? Oh, that's the wrong one. Let's go to the Feast of Trumpets, 2037, okay? So Feast of Trumpets, 2037. It's the beginning of the seventh year of trumpets, uh, of the trumpet judgments, or it's the beginning of the 14th year of tribulation at the day of the Lord, the year of his vengeance. The day and hour that Matthew said no one knows which leaves the one year which is as Enoch, as Matthew 24 says, which we know is a year and 10 days to the blowing of the shofar because they're going to announce that the shofar blowing the Jubilee. Ta-da! Isn't that awesome? So, Feast of Trumpets, 2037. What do you think they read at the Feast of Trumpets? Again, they read it at the Feast of Trumpets all the time. But let me show you something specific because this isn't exactly at the Feast of Trumpets. I want to show you something. Uh, Let me do this again. Watch this. Let me get to the right year. Feast of Trumpets, 2037. And they have, oh, let me bring something up. This is what our brother uh, Chris had shared. Okay, let me add the weekly Torah portion. Are you ready for this? So their weekly Torah portion. Okay, listen to this. In 2037, here's the day and hour that no one knows of the coming of the Lord. Okay, in Matthew chapter 24. And on the Torah portion, which would be read from here to here. Check this out. Okay, we're going to read what this Torah portion is. Hold on a second. Hold on. Now I got to go back to it. Give me a second. 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 Oh, come on. Where did it go? On the Torah portion. So I've got it on 2023. But the Shabbat Shuva is what it's called. Okay, listen to what it says. This Sabbath is named after the first word of the Haftarah, Hosea 14. Hosea 14, verse 2 through 10. And it literally means return. It literally means return. 
It literally means return. Let me go back to 2037. You guys got to see this. Watch this. The Torah portion at the time of the Feast of Weeks in any year. But the point is that it's at the time of the Feast of Weeks. The Torah portion that's read. Sorry, sorry. At the Feast of Trumpets. The Torah portion that's read in the half Torah on the Sabbath is, why can't I find it again? I just showed you. Anyways, it means return. So on this Torah reading, they have the portion called, come on, where it's got to be, ah, there we go. The half Torah, there it is right there. Okay, it's from Hosea chapter 14. When, when do we see the Lord coming? It's either going to be on day one or day two of Matthew 24, the day and hour no one knows, that will begin the final year of the Lord, the year of his vengeance. And on this Sabbath, they're reading from Hosea chapter 14. Now, for those of you who have been around for a little bit, and for those of you even who are new but have been following what I've been talking about, remember what I was talking about, these chapters to years? Hosea is one written to the Gentiles, and Zechariah is written to Judah. It turns out they're the only two books in the entire Bible that each have 14 chapters. When I discovered this, I thought, oh my goodness, I instantly knew. That one was to the world, to the Gentiles, right? House of Israel. And that the other one was to Judah. Well, what would it equal? The end of that 13th and the start of the final 14th year, right? What's the start of the 14th year? The start of the 14th year, see? Seven of seals, seven of trumpets. The start of the 14th year in 2037 is the time of the Feast of Trumpets. And that Sabbath, what are they reading? What are they reading? They're reading from a book we've been teaching on for five years, revealing chapters to years. And in the 14th chapter, they're reading, O return, is, uh, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God. He says, listen to this. Listen to this. Verse 7 of Hosea 14. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive. Which means what? Quicken, bring back to life. As the corn, which is what? The wheat. Who are these? Who are those that he's going to revive who put their necks on the line that are going to, hello, and grow as the vine. It's a picture of the final year of tribulation, and we've taught on this over the years from Hosea 14. Well, it rings a bell too, doesn't it? Because in Zechariah, which is the one to, the, to Judah, if this is a picture of the return of the Lord at the time of the Feast of Trumpets of the beginning of the 14th year, then do you think Zechariah would have the same thing? But they're not returning. It's not about a mountain of the Lord in this case, is it? Because in Zechariah chapter 14, we read in verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem to the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst of our... It's the return of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives at the beginning of the sounding of the seventh trumpet. It's the exact same story that you read in Matthew chapter 24 at the coming of the Lord after, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, when he will be seen coming in, which means on the clouds of heaven. When is he going to be, what's it going to look like? Verse 27, for as the lightning that lighteth out of the east and shineth unto the west, 
show, show, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And when he comes, it'll be the day and hour, feast of trumpets that no one knows, whether it's the first day or the second day. And there they are, reading from Hosea chapter 14, a direct picture that we've been teaching on for years, that Hosea to Zechariah, the 14 years, and in both cases, it's a picture of the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's the return at the start of the 14th year on the day and hour no one knows. Isn't that wild? Oh, did you think it was done? No, no, no. Let's, let's push this a little bit further. Here we are now, Rosh Hashanah. So now we're looking at the actual Feast of Trumpets of 2037, the day and hour no one knows, the start of the 14th year of tribulation, the beginning of the vengeance of the Lord, the year of his vengeance. September 10th to the 11th, September 11th, 2037. Let's have a look. The day and hour no one knows. Rosh Hashanah 2037 takes place, of course, over two days. And no one knows whether it's Rosh Hashanah day one or Rosh Hashanah day two. Um, maybe you're already seeing it. Maybe it caught your attention a little while ago. Do you remember the story as I was saying all of these chapters to years and I showed John here and the events of John and I showed Genesis and we showed the connection in Jose in um in Hebrews and showed that chapter 20 uh, uh um was connected to uh, um Isaac being born and it was in chapter 21 right we see the story of the ark in the from the 7th to the 8th chapter the pre-trib happens in the 7th it goes in then to the eighth chapter, and it's a picture of the 14 years beginning. And then what do we see? Chapter 21, the beginning of the 14th year, where Abraham has Ishmael, and he's 86, 13 years later, after 20, he's 99 years old, and Ishmael is 13, and then Abraham turns 100, and Isaac is born. It's the same picture. Well. Let's have a look and see what happens. Here we are. Start of the 14th year. It equals the start of Genesis chapter 21. In the chapters to years. Let's go read what they read at the Feast of Trumpets. Rosh Hashanah day one or Rosh Hashanah day two. Look at what they read on Rosh Hashanah day one. Genesis chapter 21. <laughs> I didn't know, guys, I had no idea about any of this stuff. We have been proving this out in chapters to years for years. Over and over, every connection over and over and over again. We've even been showing this stuff from Deuteronomy. And it never even dawned on me that unleavened bread was six and then the seventh and tabernacles was seven and then the eighth. Everything we've been showing, it's all true. 100% everything is true. What happens in Genesis chapter 21? The birth of Isaac. When? At the start of the chapter. Where did it start in Hosea 14? The start of the chapter. Where did it start in Zechariah 14? The start of the chapter. Each and every one of them. Genesis 21, Hosea 4, Zechariah 14, and Hosea 14. <clears throat> you getting it? They even have it being read in all of these feasts. But do you think that's it? Or do you think maybe there's one more? Well, guess what? We know that the story plays out that this was the Feast of Trumpets that started the seventh year. 
and according now matthew uh, uh um yeah matthew said day and hour no one knows so i'm going to accept truly that it's the day and hour no one knows even though the torah portion is connected to day one the torah portion <clears throat> is connected to day one to genesis 21 well what about day two whoops what about day two day two <clears throat> excuse me now when the 14th year is over the Jew, the the jubilee year starts at the feast of trumpets it starts at the feast of trumpets and on the 10th day they sound the shofar of the jubilee but it's going to start on the feast of trumpets so what if we go and look what they read in 2038 or every year of the feast of trumpets but what if we go to 28 2038 feast of trumpets and read what they read on the second day of the day and hour no one knows Ta-da! genesis 22 <laughs> what genesis 22 so in feast of trumpets they're reading genesis 21 and it's the equivalent in the chapters to years of Genesis chapter 21 and the return of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives, Hosea 14, Zechariah 14, uh, 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 Genesis 21. And day two, they read from Genesis chapter 22 and 22 is the picture of the new beginning. What is chapter 22? Here it is. Chapter 22, it's the picture of the new beginning. It is the year of Jubilee which in the big picture of 22 years is the 22nd year Jubilee new beginning, like it would be like a, like a Genesis 22. There's the Lord. There is the new Jubilee. And it's the same picture as six years of seals, the seventh of rest, seven years of trumpets, and the seventh year of trumpets rest. It's the same thing as the 22nd year final Jubilee. And at the Feast of Trumpets, the beginning of the Jubilee year, they're reading Genesis 22. <laughs> oh. Do you understand how awesome all this is? Did you understand how awesome it was that they're even reading Jeremiah 31? At the Feast of Trumpets? And at the Feast of Weeks, they're reading from Ruth. Pre, mid, post. It's been revealed. It's understood, brothers and sisters. Now the only hope and the only, I shouldn't say only hope, but now the prayer in the revelation is that it truly is 2024 and when you go read jeremiah chapter 25 and see what happens when 70 years are complete it's called the crushing of the grapes and it is exactly the second battle of the lord when he's all uppercase king of kings lord of lords at the treading of the grapes the day of the Lord, which is the year of his wrath. This is awesome. You guys now know. You should be able to stand so strong. So strong in the revelation being revealed. As much as we want it, as much as we desire for it to be at the fall feast. And it's just, it's a hope. I Here's the thing. I understand, guys. I understand with all my heart that you just, it, it helps sustain some of you to keep going. But isn't the truth better? 
isn't actually being able to understand so much more exciting. It could free your mind to think and do the things that need to be done in the Lord. You now know and understand the revelation of pre, mid, and post in Deuteronomy perfectly revealed to the revelation of the end of days. The pre-trib bride of Christ is going at the true feast of weeks. 50 days later, the red horse rider, the 14 years of tribulation begin. And it starts with the destruction of Jerusalem. And World War III breaks out from that point and the Jews are scattered to the mountains. World War III breaks out it's now the seven years of seals. It's going to be the church age coming to the end when seals are over. It's going to start at the Feast of Trumpets 2024, if that's the year. It will end just before Feast of Trumpets, and they'll see the Lord coming. And at Feast of Trumpets, like Matthew 13, the day and hour no one knows will be the Feast of Trumpets just as Jeremiah 31. They will see him come. Then the great multitude rapture will be taken in at the Passover time frame, whether first or second Passover, in the year 2031. Then the Feast of Trumpets will begin. The Lord will have already been here for a year. Then when the, feast, uh, when the trumpet judgments begin at the Feast of Trumpets 2031, the city and the streets will get rebuilt till Messiah is cut off. And when he's cut off at the end of the sixth, he will return at the Feast of Trumpets of 2037, feet down on the Mount of Olives for the whole world to see him from one end unto the other. And the nations will be gathered again at the great harvest of the wine press of the wrath of God. And when it's over at the Feast of Trumpets 2038, it will be, actually, the declaration happens on the 10th day of the first of, of the new year of the Feast of Trumpets of the Jubilee. On the 10th day, the trumpet of Jubilee will sound. It'll be the equivalent of the year and 10 days of the final year of Noah to the final Jubilee. The trumpet sounds. The Jubilee is declared. They will be restored. They will be brought in. and. It will be the seven-day wedding for his Jewish bride. And on the eighth day, it's the new beginning of the Jubilee year. We have understood, brothers and sisters. We have understood. One last time. Feast of Weeks. Pre-trib, 100% pre-trib bride of Christ. Lord comes at the end of six at the feast of trumpets to start the seventh year of seals and the great multitude rapture who have seen him come will be brought in by Passover, first or second Passover of 2031. <clears throat> then they will start the trumpet judgments where the city and the streets and the temple are being rebuilt and the temple's being rebuilt on the foundation that was laid during seals until Messiah is cut off and Satan, having opened the pit, having been cast down and more chaos breaking out, he will have two and a half years till the end of the sixth year of trumpets to which the Lord returns at the Feast of Trumpets to begin his final year. And then the Jubilee year from trumpets the announcement of the, the shofar blast and the seven-day wedding, which is exactly how it comes to an end when you go to Matthew chapter 25 and all you need to do is follow in order from 24. Watch what happens. There's the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. That's because he's going to stand in the newly built temple at mid-trumpets. That's when Messiah gets cut off. It's going to be worse than it ever was up to that point at any time in human history. Um, 
uh, there's the false prophet and the Antichrist is back. Then there's the coming of the Son of Man. Two, two and a half years have come to an end. There he is seen coming after the tribulation, immediately after the tribulation of those days. He's now going to come on the clouds for the whole world to see from one end unto the other as lightning from one end unto the other. It'll be at the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows. And in that final year, the day of the, of the year of the Lord's vengeance is going to be as it was in the days of Noah, which is a year and 10 days. When that year and 10 days to atonement is done and the Lord has now taken care of all business, destroyed the, the, all of the enemies, Satan has been bound and, and the beast and the false prophet are the first two cast into the pit. Then it's the time for the kingdom of heaven, which is the promise of the Jews, heaven on earth. And we see the wedding take place. This is going to be the wedding at the Feast of Tabernacles in 2038. The Feast of Tabernacles, 2038. The marriage for the one-week Jewish bride wedding. And everyone else, not a part of it, will be cast out in the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brothers and sisters, you have understood. You've got it. Listen to this again. Take your time. Study it. Seek it. Search it out. There's so much in here that you can dig into and really sink your teeth and grasp it and understand it and know it unequivocally. We've been given the revelation of the end of days, brothers and sisters. We've been given the revelation of the end of days. And we now have two witnesses claiming, clearly hearing from the Lord, who is putting 750,000 subscribers at stake. And we have another one who had died and gone, and the angel told them 2024. One year, and the other said 2024. And the scriptures revealed to us that that is exactly true, because when the 70th year is over, it's the year of the wrath of the Lord. And the only way that that lines up and that the Jubilee from when Christ made the declaration in Luke chapter 4 that lines up exactly to the count here only lines up if it all begins in 2024. And the pre-trib is the Feast of Weeks, the true Feast of Weeks, of which I believe will be 2024. Brothers and sisters, I am pumped up i am so excited i know we've got several months to go don't let that get you down we're here call each other you know go have coffee if you if you know some people in the forum or throughout the ministry gather together don't stay secluded if if you're feeling weighty and burdened try to reach out to brothers and sisters that are local if they're in the ministry even better don't allow yourself to get so down because look at what you know. Look at what you know. It's so awesome. I love you guys. I pray for you guys every single night in your families. I'm so grateful and honored to be a part of all of this with you and that the Lord through the Father's will in Christ Jesus by the power of his Holy Ghost has led us in the truth and the revelation of our Lord and Savior to prepare a people for the end. In our Lord and G Jesus Christ will, and in the will of the Father. Amen, amen, and amen. Watch it again and again. Soak it in. Save it. Put a star and keep it for when you're feeling down to watch it again. This is the real deal. It's all true. I love you. God bless you. Bye for now.